Okay, so we're gonna uh, we're gonna keep the program going. Uh, the next person I'm bringing to the stage really needs no introduction. Um, you spent quite a bit of time with him earlier this morning. He's back for some more content, um, some more strategies. Please put your hands together, Mr. Jamie McIntyre. <laughs> Target is 250,000 we've got to make or save from the things we learn uh, over the next four days. Uh, who's already found some ways to make or save some money just from what you've learned so far? Uh, and we're halfway through or just over halfway through the first day. Um, as I said, there's, there's certainly lots to learn and uh, you will be going through a lot of things. This session, I want to get into some details of how to grow businesses. So I know some of you are in business, some of you are starting businesses. It doesn't matter, all this knowledge will apply to everyone in some way. If you work for someone, you should be learning this to how to grow the company you work for um, because you can make money as well. So um, a few things I'll talk about that. I mean, most of the companies that I've built have been debt free. Uh, I haven't had to borrow money or, or from um, banks. Um, there is risks in borrowing money from banks. Some companies, it depends on the industry, you do need to borrow that, so it's a very handy session and be able to have business finance. Factoring is certainly a good idea as well for a lot of companies. Uh, I don't trust banks, I prefer now, I mean, most of my companies, I make sure I don't have any, I don't have any corporate debt. Um, I just don't trust banks. I've seen what banks can do in a downturn. It's true what you were saying and, and Stephen was saying that in the good times, they'll beg you to take money. Uh, like before the credit crisis, they come chasing you. Here, we'll give you this, we'll give you that. They'll loan you lots of money. Uh, once the credit crisis hits, uh, they go back and they pull in lines of credit, they pull in overdrafts uh, because they get nervous and they just pull them in whether, uh, you know, and they can destroy companies. I remember Storm Financial, um, they threatened, I mean, I didn't agree with Storm Financial's business model, but they were, th they, they were threatening to sue CBA, who was one of their product partners. And uh, CBA said, fine, sue us. And guess what happened? They got a letter the next few days. Uh, your $20 million uh, overdraft facility with CBA has been withdrawn. You have 30 days to repay it. And, and Storm Financial went under, of course, because most businesses can't repay money. So debt is obviously important, um, but you always have to be aware of that, um, you know, how to manage that, because in business, uh, some people probably learned the hard way. Banks can, um, banks, you know, they look after their interest. Uh, generally ahead of your own. Um, so let's in this session look at how do we go about growing a business. First of all, one of the things, I'll share a story. My mother, um, um, years ago, like many people, they decide they um, want to start a business. And so she decided to buy a coffee shop. And a uh, small country town where I grew up in northern New South Wales, Glen Ernest, in the main street, she decided to buy a coffee shop. I can't remember the figures now, it is in my book. Um, but I'm thinking somewhere around eighty, hundred thousand dollars So they didn't have the, all the money, so her and dad borrowed the money to buy the coffee shop. I didn't know until later that they had the same opportunity when they bought the coffee shop. They could also bought the building that was in the coffee shop. But my dad at the time said, look, we're borrowing enough money to buy for the coffee shop. I don't want to go into any more debt because debt in most people's mind is bad. Uh, they equal pain to that. Where in hindsight, or what I would have done, is I would have borrowed also extra to buy the building to make sense, because if you own the commercial building that your business is in, it's quite a bit like what Paul's talking about. I do the same thing, it's quite a smart strategy. Um, because what you can do with a commercial building, commercial buildings are valued based mainly on their rent. Does that make sense? Like residential is not so much based on rent, um, but commercial buildings, the more rent they get, is the higher their value are. So what I do when I buy commercial buildings, if they're buildings that I have my companies in, the first thing I will do is jack up the what? The rent. So uh, my trust would own the uh, buildings. Uh, my other companies would have running businesses in there. The first thing I'm looking for is I jack up the rent. Now you can't be ridiculous about it. it has to still be commercial, but you know commercial can vary 20, 30 percent. You know difference of what's commercial. So by increasing the rent on your um, building, then the building's worth more. Does it make sense? Um, so a good strategy for many of you as you're building, be, becoming an entrepreneur is what Stephen was talking about, building your parallel assets. Now, most of you are trained through 21st century, so you're already building property assets uh, and or stock market assets. But you, I think you should be doing it in parallel. So a great way being an entrepreneur, if you have staff and you have to lease 
an office is looking at buying the office in your trust. Does that make sense? Because it's often cheaper to buy the commercial building. Uh, the interest you'll pay is often way less than the rent you're paying. And, and, when you, and you obviously keep it separate. Would you buy the commercial building in your trading company? Yes or no? Absolutely not. You'd be a complete idiot to do that. If you did that, you're a complete idiot. Write that down. If you ever do that, I'm a complete idiot. Go and see Paul or Warren will speak to you tomorrow or my other accountants, Arj, will speak to you on, on Monday. Um, you're going to have access to a lot of different accounting experts and uh, it's important to have advisors. He's jot this down as one lesson is that um, a, smart, a smart entrepreneur will have advisors. I don't care what stage your business is at, but you should be looking to get an advisory board or committee together of external advisors, many that will help you out for free. You might only meet up every six to eight weeks, but it mightn't be an official board, but it might be an advisory committee. You want to have external voices, external viewpoints uh, on, you know, on helping you with your company. And by having a board in place, or even if it's a, an, just an advisory board, your companies will be better managed. Does that make sense? Now, some of you might be just starting up, but you still want to have that. That's what professional entrepreneurs have. And I find it invaluable by having external advice. So I have advisors. One of my board members you know, adv on the advisory committee will be here tomorrow to share with you for half an hour in the morning. Um, and he, you know, he is what we call the gray hair. When you're a younger entrepreneur, you want to have the gray hair on your board. Does it make sense? Um, because if you're going to, I know when I was going to list on the ASX, it was you know, important. If you're the young entrepreneur, they want to know that you have people around you that have a lot more experience. Okay, so you have a more balanced, um, because entrepreneurs tend to be rebellious and that can be part of their strength, but they can also, investors going to go, well, we don't want an entrepreneur that's too rebellious. Uh, we want one that's balanced. Does it make sense? So that's why you have a board. You can bring in advice, etc., from others. So most of you should, even if you don't have, let me ask you, who has an advisory committee or board in place already in their companies? Okay. Hardly anyone. Even if you only have small businesses, you should still be uh, looking to set that up from day one. Okay. Um, where's I up to before that? I was talking about something. Oh, yeah, my mum's coffee shop. So why am I telling you a story about my mum's coffee shop? Well, every story has a lot of lessons that we can all learn from that. Um, so anyhow, she didn't buy the commercial building, which was one mistake. So you should be thinking about that, buying the commercial building. It's a great way you know, to build up uh, an asset. But outside of that, so anyhow, she had a coffee business. She was excited to start a business. But after a while, the stress of running her own business, um, she would have been better off. Now, where, why she bought it, she was working in the coffee shop before for some extra income. And, um, and then she's like, I could run this business better. I'm going to buy it. So she went from having a safe, secure salary to buying the business to having no salary and, and, and generally no income in the beginning. So she's working now twice as many hours for less money. That's just generally traditional business. That's what it is in the beginning. So there she is running the caf cafe. And after a period of time, she's getting stressed out. And uh, like most people in business, they don't ask for help. Um, so I was talking to my mum one day anyhow. And I said, you don't have to ask for help. I'll, I'll tell you what I would do if I was uh, running a coffee shop. Um, but I, I can tell you this, most people don't do the things they need to do, so I'll give you the advice for free because I'm your son, um, but you probably won't act upon it because most people won't. Um, but here's what I would do. If I owned the coffee shop, mum, this is what I would do. First of all, what I would do, because she's not making enough profit, she's working hard, she's struggling, putting the effort in. I said, first thing I would do is, one, I would increase your prices by 10% across the board. Jot this down. And I'm telling you now, this is what most of you should be doing. I would be increasing the prices across the board by 10%. Now, when I suggest that, many people go, oh, you don't understand my business, I can't put my prices up. Now, you've got to test and measure everything. Um, so this may not work for every business, but for a lot of business, if I was a consultant to come into your business and you owned a coffee shop, that's the first thing I would say, is put your prices up by 10%. Why would you be running a business that's making virtually no profit? Um, but by putting prices up by 10%, something magical happens in business, okay? Now, first of all, what's going to happen? Now, the reason many people won't do this and won't charge enough for their product or service is that they don't feel worthy. They're like, but what if I put my prices up and, and people don't come or I lose clients or people won't love me? So a bad self-worth is that maybe people won't love me. If I put my prices up, I might be rejected. So humans have this innate fear of being rejected. And that's one of the reasons they're not successful. Because to be successful, you have to put yourself out there where you have a higher risk of being embarrassed or rejected. True? 
So most people play it small and they don't want to risk the pain associated to rejection. They don't want to risk charging enough because they're afraid maybe people won't love me. Does it make sense? So most people go about their jobs and don't ask for a pay rise or don't ask for enough. Most people go about their businesses and carry this mentality in or they take their mentality where they're at financially and project that out into the world. And they don't realize, I've helped so many people, and just say, and put your prices up. There's a lot of people, let me ask you a question. If you were going out on a first date and you wanted to get the result, whatever that result may be, Okay, is it a good idea, guys? Let me ask guys in the room. Is it a good idea to take a first date to McDonald's? Yes or no? No. Generally not. Okay, it's probably not going to get you the result you're after. <laughs> Therefore, <laughs> I know some wealthy people. They deliberately do that just to make sure there's no gold diggers, right? Um, or they have an old car, so they pick up their potential dates in an old car just to see the look on their face, you know just to see if they're gold diggers or they can be flexible. And um, so the idea is that why don't we just go to McDonald's? Because you know, McDonald's is cheap, right? Why don't we just go to McDonald's? Why would you pay more for a, another restaurant when McDonald's is cheaper? Tell me, why do you pay more? You want to go somewhere, you want quality, you want a better experience, you want fine dining restaurants. Make sense? You as a consumer are happy to go to more expensive restaurants because you want that better experience, a better service, better quality food, whatever. Making sense? So what a lot of people do in their business, let's say they're starting out, they're not earning a lot of money, they project their financial capabilities out into the world and out onto their customers. And you don't want to do that. Because let's say if you don't have a lot of money, then you can have a perception of the world that there's not a lot of money in the world. True? You can have a perception there's not a lot of money in the economy. And if you project that out there, you'll attract that not a lot of money. Does that make sense? And people do this in business all the time. There's a lot of people that go, you know what, I don't want McDonald's. I'm happy to go out to a fine dining restaurant. I know it'll cost me five times as much, but I'm prepared to pay because that's what I want. Does it make sense? You are at times prepared to do that, and other people are in society. Um, so we don't want to often charge too little. Most people don't charge enough. And I'm not saying charge and be a ripoff. I'm saying if you're going to increase your prices, you're going to increase your value. You're going to increase your offering. You're going to put more into it. But my point to my mum was that if you are charging an extra 10%, let's say as an example, I'll just put some rough figures out here. Let's say her coffee shop was doing 10,000 a week. I have no idea what it was doing, but let's just keep ballpark figures. Now, if she puts her prices up and she loses a couple of clients, will it hurt? I said, if a few don't come back, I mean, is a, a cup of coffee is $3.50 and you put it up by 10%, it's $3.85. Is it really going to affect most customers? No. The few that it does, let them go down to the other coffee shop down the street and let them go broke serving them. True? I said, Mum, you work very hard here. Most of your community of people that come, come because they like you and or they know you or they're related to you. <laughs> and they, um, they would not be comfortable about knowing that they're only paying and you're only charging prices that's sending you broke, you're barely making money. That actually, be, they want, why? That's an un, not a win win relationship. You're giving great service, you should win, and so should your customers. Does it make sense? It has to be a win win. It can't be your customers winning and you going broke. It can't be you winning and your customers going broke. You know, it has to be that sustainable balance. Making sense? And we have to get that right. You have to add value, you have to make a profit, and there's those two tensions that are pulling all the time, but you have to get them balanced. That's what you're facing at. So I said, okay, you might lose a few customers, I doubt it, okay? And it's good if you lose some customers. So $10,000, um, let's say she puts the prices up by 10% as an example. That means she pick up a potential extra $1,000 a week, right? Now, at the time, she was struggling to make $500 a week, less than what she was earning when she worked for the coffee shop. So she's making, say, $500 a week. She puts her prices up by just 10%, which is an extra $1,000 a week. Now, that extra $1,000 is pretty much all profit when you think about it. She's already paying the rent. She's already paying the salary. Uh, she's already paying the food, etc. So pretty much most of that goes to the bottom line. True? But if you add that to the um, $500, her, her income would, in that example, jump from $500 a week to $1,500 a week. 
Is that a 10% increase or how, what percentage increase on profit is that? It's 300%. The point is often a small increase in prices can have an exponential increase in profitability. Repeat after me. Mm, something to think about. Guys, you've got to understand that in business, we're talking, it's all about the bottom line as far as the financials. You can turn over a lot of revenue and not make profit. Those companies don't stick around a long time. It's not how much revenue turn over. It's what you've got left. And that's what many of you in your businesses, before you start growing and stuff like that, want to start fine-tuning a few things. Fine-tuning might be just putting your prices up in some cases. Now, I can't speak for everyone because, the, yes, there is differences. But a lot of people go, oh, he doesn't understand my business. I can't do that. Generally, jot this down. Bullshit. In most cases, bullshit. You can do it. You just won't do it for probably the same reasons my mum wouldn't do it. Maybe people won't love me. Maybe I'll be rejected. Maybe I'll fail. True? Now, jot this down. What we want to do in anything that we do, we should do, it's called test. Jot it down. Test and what? Measure. As an entrepreneur, this is what you must get good at. Same with investing. I teach you the same thing. Test the strategy. Measure the results. You don't go out and go, wow, I'm going to jump my prices up across the board. You would test that on a small scale. And if it works, roll it out. Okay? Now, the great thing these days, thanks to Google and Facebook, is you can test things. I mean, one of the reasons Obama got re-elected is because he's very good at technology and Facebook and social media. That's how he originally got elected, okay? But he got re-elected because he had a superior social media team than Romney had. Romney, you know, still too much old school in his team, and they just went up to speed. Uh, Obama has a very powerful groundswell because there's a lot of you know, younger people support him more uh, than, say, where Romney has a lot more... Uh, more older supporters. So as a result of that, and, and Chris Hughes, the co-founder of um, Facebook, is what you know, really helped the Obama administration get elected in the first place by helping them with the social media strategy. So my point is that they, was, they were able to, they don't test a policy or test a message for Obama to present out to mainstream media. They go and test a dozen or so different political messages on Facebook. And by getting user groups on small amount, they'd be able to see which ones people resonate with the most, which ones people click on the most. And out of that, they could test which messages are going to cut it. Then, once they've got a testing, then they go out and spruik that message, already knowing the bit, fair amount of feedback, whether it'll be successful. Who's following what I'm saying here? Because a political campaign is a PR selling campaign, OK? And they'll do the same thing now in Australia when the election comes up next year. They'll be, I mean, they're not as savvy as Obama or, or the American politicians, but they'll be, they're already working on some of that sort of stuff, okay? Now, is a business, which should you be doing the same thing, yes or no? You should be testing price. You test your price. How do you know what price? Most people think people only buy on price, but I've proven you that's not true. Okay, you go to a fine dining restaurant where the meals are a fraction of the size, but 10 times as much, where you can go to McDonald's and the meals are bigger, you notice that? You go to America, the meals are gigantic. The cheaper a restaurant, the bigger the meal. It's ironic. But we don't always buy on price. Sometimes we buy on price, but most people in society want something else. So you need to test price. Some of the reasons your products in your company may not be selling is because they're probably too cheap. Therefore, people that would love to spend money with you don't consider it um, of value because the price is too cheap. If it's that cheap, it must be very good. Does that make sense? If you charge more, people go, wow, it must be really good. Now, if you charge more, you can afford to put more effort into it and deliver a better product or service. Making sense? Because your job is to add value. It's hard to add value if you're stressed out, going broke, and you can't focus your attention on your customers when your attention's all on you. But if you have it as a win-win and get that me happy medium where you're doing well and your customers are doing well, you are in a better position. Is it true? You're financially stronger. You're in a better position to help your customers. Yes or no? And you're more a happy person. You're more outgoing. And you're going to have more energy to give. Okay? Jot this down. Society rewards passion. Society rewards passion. The highest paid people on the planet are the people that are most passionate about what they do. Is Oprah Winfrey passionate woman? Yes or no? Yes. She's also a billionaire. Is Donald Trump 
Trump, passionate about real estate and his properties, yes or no? Yeah. Absolutely, he's passionate, he's obsessed, he's dedicated to it, and he delivers in property. Whether you like him or not, he's been successful. Is Richard Branson passionate about the Virgin brand? He has passion. Society rewards passion. You go into a restaurant, and some restaurants like, or cafes, they're, like, they're looking at their watch, they can't wait till you leave. You're like, they don't want you there because they're employees. They hate their job. It's just a job to them. They don't mean to service. And you get that feeling. Do you tip them, yes or no? Do you tell your friends about them? Only in a negative way, not in a positive way. You go to this place, it's crap. Okay? Uh, but if you go into a great restaurant or a great business and, and the, you can tell the, the, the staff or the team are like really passionate, they're there, their number one priority is to serve you. Yeah, sure, it may be a job and maybe they're paid to do it, but you can tell there's something more than that about that. They're actually really proud of what they're doing. They want to deliver a great job. Okay? They want you to be, have an amazing experience. They probably enjoy their work more as well because they're focused not on the money but on being the best they can be. Now, are you more likely to tip them, yes or no? Are you more likely to tell your friends? Yeah. It's a great restaurant. Are, if you're an entrepreneur, more likely to headhunt them for a job? Yes or no? Yeah, totally. Does it make sense? I'm always looking to headhunt people. If, if you recognize someone that's outstanding customer service or in anywhere, you're like, that person's good. Okay? And I've had many people that I, I've poached, okay, where you recognize talent. And have someone contact them and see if they want to work in our organizations because good people are rare. Does it make sense? Society rewards passion. You have to be passionate about what you're doing and what you believe in. And that will, like Nathan Tinkler, did he have passion and belief in what he was doing? Yes or no? Yes. He had to be able to influence other people, it made him a billionaire. If he was like, yeah, I hope this works, some idea, that's, you know, if you give me two and a half million, I'm not sure it'll work, but it, yeah, if it does, good luck. If it doesn't, stuff you. That's not very convincing, is it? He's like, I'm in the coal industry, um, there's no guarantee, however, I'm very confident and you know, I believe we can do this and here's the returns if you do this. There is some downside, but here's, here's the upside. I'm absolutely committed to doing this. I've got my own money on the line, a million dollars non-refundable. I wouldn't do that, I was an idiot. True? Much more, influ much more persuasive. Um, and same thing if you want to raise capital. Put some of your own money in. How many people want someone else to take all the risks? And the main thing investors are going to be looking for is, do you have any skin in the game? Do you have any of your own money in the game? Because it's very easy just to you know, you spend other people's money. Uh, you know, so if you've got some of your own money in the game and put some of the hard work in, that's one way to attract capital as well because people will respect that more. Um, is this making sense? So jot this down, action step. You should have in the back of your notes action steps as you're going throughout this weekend. When I'm sitting in seminars, I actually have my iPhone out in my notes section or I'm emailing my team instantly. I don't wait when I hear a good idea to um, think about it and doing it next Tuesday. I will email immediately when I get the idea and you'll hear my team can justify this. If they share a good idea or someone, I'll, I'll start writing the email in front of them to my team, let's implement this immediately. Never leave the scene, jot this down, never leave the scene of a decision without taking some immediate action towards the attainment of that goal. My friend and mentor, Tony Robbins, uh, always said this, never leave the scene of a decision without taking some immediate action towards the attainment of that goal. Does it make sense? So you have to get good at taking action. The reason I'm a multi-millionaire and live my dreams is because I'm good, I get ideas, I'm open-minded, and I action the ideas rapidly. It doesn't mean every idea works. Ask my team. And they may have to go through 10 ideas, but if one works, all of a sudden, you've created more success. So you have to get good at taking ideas and action them immediately. There's the definition of uh, intelligence. Most people think it's academic success and academic knowledge, but as... Um, Albert Einstein said the true definition of intelligence is the ability to entertain a new idea. Think about that. The ability to entertain a new idea. And it highlights that most people are actually uh, narrow-minded and as a result of that's why they're not rich. They can't entertain new ideas. So I added to that, it's not only the ability to entertain new ideas, it's also the ability to action those ideas. In, in, in actual fact, you don't even have to be the person with the idea. There's plenty of ideas to create wealth. You just have to be the person to action the idea that's more likely to succeed. Look at Bill Gates, one of the wealthiest person on the planet. MS-DOS was not his idea, was it? He bought that idea. It was someone else's idea. He saw the opportunity, actioned the idea, and Microsoft become the powerhouse it was. Okay? 
still is, but was, okay? Um, so that's the, you don't have to have the idea. Uh, Mark Zuckerberg of Facebook, was it just his idea about Facebook or was it commonly known at the time? The Harvard, all the colleges, Harvard and Stanford were saying, we need to take our Facebook, which is, you know, when you go to school, you have those photo journals of your class and put it online, wish someone would do it. Everyone was talking about, wish someone would do it. Well, he got off his button, just actually did it in a very effective way, okay? He actioned the idea better than anyone else. And as a result, he built a $100 billion company in less than, what, four or five years, the fastest $100 billion company on the planet. So that, that's critical to understand that. So if we understand one of the action steps is we're going to consider, test the measure, increasing our prices. A 10% increase in price can lead to, in that example, a 300% increase in bottom line. The other thing that you're looking for in companies, um, before we look at even growing a company, is that you want to be continually focused, you need to be able to continually focus on increasing sales and revenue. But at the same time, you have to have a dual focus on decreasing costs. True? Now, as an entrepreneur, these are the two skill sets you're going to have to develop. And they're almost like contradictory skill sets. Because one is about abundance. And one is about what? Well, it's more of a scarcity mentality. We may not have enough money, we have to cut costs. Okay? Now, I believe in abundance. You know, at school we're taught economics is the study of scarce resources, which, jot this down, is bullshit. Okay? It's not actually true. I don't believe in the scarcity model. Now, you can if that's your map of the world, but if you have a map of the world that's a scarcity model, you'll project and manifest scarcity into your life. So by all means, believe that to be true if you wish. I don't. Uh, I have an abundance view of the world. I believe that uh, there's an infinite intelligence uh, and there's infinite amount of resources. And let me explain what I mean. People say, well, Jamie, how did you say that? The world's running out of oil. Well, they said that in 1971, didn't they? Well, some of you weren't around then. Neither was I. But uh, they did say in 1971, the world's running out of oil, the energy crisis. Remember, if you study history, well, the world didn't run out of oil in the 70s as they thought about. It hasn't still run out of oil because they didn't take into fact that, well, we could double, increase the fuel efficiencies of carburetors. Uh, we could make, um, we could find through technology more oil reserves. So there's, you know, there's been a, you know, a lot more oil found. And then they thought even some years ago, okay, there's still a debate, the world's running out of oil. But now the US has gone from being a dependent on the Middle East for oil within a matter of a few years, it won't even need one single barrel of oil from the Middle East ever again, because they discovered through technology, shale oil, gas and things like that. So they're able to now produce uh, most of their oil reserves for themselves. Does that make sense? So just like in, in when oil was first discovered, it was a black sludge in the ground in Texas. It, was just, it wasn't considered a valuable commodity and to human intelligence was able to identify and turn that black sludge into something of value. Does it make sense? It's, there's an unlimited abundance on the planet because it all becomes between the human ability to recognize something and create something out of nothing. Does it make sense? Yeah, the, oil, the world may run out of oil, but guess what? Oil was worthless some time ago. It had no value until humans created the value out of it. And do humans have the capability of creating other energy sources? Yes or no? And as a result, they will, okay? They just have to do it at a nice structural changeover that, you know, the world becomes less oil dependent. But the point is, that's an example to say there, you know, it's just like people say, well, Jamie, you don't understand, there's people starving in this, in this world. Are they starving from a lack of food, yes or no? Yeah. Well, actually not from a lack of food. They may personally have a lack of food, but is there a lack of food on the planet, yes or no? There's not a lack of food on the planet. There is plenty of food, actually through productivity and efficiency gains, we can produce more food now than we've ever produced. And in the future, we'll be able to produce even more food. So there's an abundance of food on the planet. They're saying, well, the world's population, if it has too many more, it can't feed them. Well, there's other studies coming out now saying we could double the world's population and easily feed them through technology gains, okay? So there's this unlimited abundance if we come from that paradigm of the world, okay? Now, there's no right or wrong in the world. Well, there's right or wrong, but there's no right or wrong, who's right, who's wrong. It's what map of the world do you want to have? Now, the truth is in the what? 
and results. If you have an abundance mentality, you'll have the results of abundance in your life. If you have a scarcity mentality, you'll have a scarcity in your life. If you see the world as hardly any money out there and things are tough and it's a poor world, that will be reflected. If you say, well, yes, the recession might be coming or, or this might be happening, but there's still a lot of money in the world, there's still a lot of opportunity in the world, then you will focus on that. We have a reticular activating system. You ever notice when you buy a new car? You're like, wow, you never notice anyone had this car, but once you buy it, you notice everyone else has the same car. You start to see the same car shows up everywhere. It's a reticular activating system. We now notice something, we focus on it. Same thing with money. Focus on money, you'll start to notice it more places. It'll start to show up, there's more abundance. So um, it, it's critical to, to understand that. So there's plenty of abundance. Now people say, well, there's not enough money in the world. Well, that's not true. There's unlimited amount of money in the world and they're printing off more and more uh, the US Federal Reserve every day. So if there's not enough now, there'll be a few billion more by tomorrow morning. So there's not a lack of money. So if you don't have all the money you want, it's what are you doing to prevent that money from flowing into your life? <coughs> this is a question, jot that down. What are you doing that's preventing that money in the world flowing into your life? Because if you can identify that, you can let go of the brakes. Now, the brakes are generally a personal development. What level of personal development, emotional intelligence, and financial intelligence do you have? Because if you don't develop yourself, you are holding the wealth back by your level of what you feel you're worthy of. You develop your skill sets and add more value and contribute to society more, you will feel more worthy and you'll be more open to receiving. Okay? Then there's other things you have to do as far as strategy to make sure you receive that money, okay, which we'll go through. But it all starts at the core of who you are. If you have poverty in your life, I'm suggesting it's because you're uh, projecting poverty into the world. Mm, Jamie, that's a bit harsh. What did you say? If you have poverty in your life, I'm suggesting it's because you're projecting poverty into the world. Repeat after me. Mm, something to think about. If you have abundance in your life, it's because you're projecting abundance in the world. So John Templeton was interviewed. He was the uh, Warren Buffett in the past, made his money, become a billionaire from buying penny stocks in the Great Depression when no one else would touch the stock market. He was buying. He became a billionaire, was interviewed, and they asked him, what's the one thing you can share with people that want to become wealthy in life? He said, well, people are waiting for the stock tip, like the strategy. And he shared, he said, you know, uh, the key is becoming, you know, people just wake up every day and focus on five things they're grateful for. He said, that's true wealth. You can have all the money in the world, in the bank account, but if you lose perspective on where you're from, uh, you've lost your wealth. He said, you can have no money, but you have gratitude every day for the things that you do have, then you are truly wealthy. Make sense? So wealth is always a mindset that always comes from within. And gratitude is a big part of that. But also from a psychology viewpoint, having that sort of focus daily is that when you focus on the things that you're grateful for, you're recognizing the wealth that you have and the good things you have in your life. And then you can only manifest that what you uh, have already that you can focus on. By focusing on the things you already have, you're more appreciative of that and those things can expand. So focus on the resources that you do have even if you don't have a lot of money. If you focus on the lack of things, you'll attract and manifest more lack of things. Does it make sense? You people say, what's this got to do with a business seminar? It's absolutely everything. Your manifestation and intention is very powerful. Um, Jim Carrey, uh, wrote down, uh, before he was a successful actor, he wrote, I don't know the exact figure now, but he wrote down on a check to himself, one day I will be paid this amount of money, millions and millions of dollars for a movie. And one day he got paid the exact amount that he wrote down on that check. Is that just luck or is that the power of, got written down, that's a written down goal. I mean, would that be a powerful way to write down your goals? Write them down on a check. Yeah, I mean, people go, well, you know, some people believe in goal setting, some people don't. Usually people that believe in goal setting are the ones that write their goals and achieve things. I have written down goals or typed down on the iPhone goals, uh, and I've had them you know, for a large part of my life. That's also why I achieve so many goals. Others don't believe in goals or that can't work. I can't see anything more powerful. Those who've been to our four-day event, we do the vision poster uh, on one of the days. And you know how many people, by cutting out the things that you want with nice houses or cars or whatever things you want in your life and putting up on a vision poster, 
how powerful that is. It seems like, you know, how can it work that way? But by putting that up and having a focus and putting that intention out there, uh, those things can materialize with a two, three, four, five, ten 10 years later in your life. And you go, wow, I can't believe I've got all these things that once were just a dream. Does it make sense? So there's great power in that. And so that's the same thing with your business goals or your income goals. You should be able to have already, well, write down for 2013 right now. How much do you want to earn in 2013? Write it down. Now, then what you may do is have several figures. You might go, minimum, I'd like to earn this. Um, well, you want to do too big. And best case scenario, I'd like to earn this. So you go, well, this is what... You know, I'm earning this now and I think I might be able to earn this amount, but ideally I'd like to be able to earn this amount. So you can have two targets. Now, whenever I write my goals, I always write plus, so you don't want to limit your figures, okay? So even with my different corporate goals or financial goals, I'll always say I'd like to earn this plus. In other words, so I don't want to cut it short. I earn this amount or higher. Making sense? But having the power of written down goals, then you end that, there's no point in having a strategy until you have an outcome, true? We've got to know what result we want, and then that's how you go about achieving it. For instance, um, when I talk about, you know, there's two ways. You not only have to increase sales and revenue of your companies, which you're going to be looking at, but you have to decrease costs. Now, if you want to decrease costs, sometimes you have to go into more of a fear-based mentality, but you need to have that skill set at the same time, if you look at the global issues we face right now with, uh, with Europe, you know, uh, the crisis in Europe, is that you know, Greece will never recover unless they do these two same things that I'm talking about. What I'm talking about that will turn around your own life individually, that will turn around your companies, will turn around countries. How do you think I know so much about how to run a country? It's the same thing. It's an economy. What's sustainable? We have to lower costs. Buy, but also increase revenue. So if people just focus on this, you can lower costs, but you'll still go broke. Like in Europe right now, what they're doing, the austerity measures, the banks, the IMF, etc., are going to all the countries, you've got to cut, cut your spending, lower, lower all this, otherwise they're not going to loan you more money. If that's all they do, they will send the economies broke. True? They will go, they can cut all they want, but if the economies are declining and not growing their economy and revenue, they will go broke and no one will get paid. The only way they will turn it around, yes, they have to stop the wastage, but cut out the wastage to free up resources that's going to paying too many public servants. Or in Greece, you know, you can retire at age 50 to 90% of your normal salary. You know, no wonder people retire early, okay? And you can work in the railway and earn $100,000 a year. And we talk about overpaid. That's a classic case of mismanagement by bureaucrats that have destroyed a country, okay? Destroyed a country. Because they've been borrowing off other people's money to fund a lifestyle they can't afford. And now the Greeks have a hard lesson. And now I feel sorry for a lot of the pensioners there that will live in poverty for the rest of their life, okay? But you can't live, it has to be sustainable. Now living above their means for a long time. So it's tough, but you've got lessons to learn. They can blame whoever else, it's not gonna change anything. They can keep changing their political parties in Greece, it's not gonna change much. Okay, because whatever you buy votes, what the Greece governments did for years, buy votes, give money, keep giving money to buy votes, keep in power, destroy an economy. Okay, so there's a lot of lessons we can learn from uh, Greece. Also, the more motivated Greeks moved to Melbourne. Is that true? <laughs> <laughs> the smart ones, hardworking ones moved. They were willing to deal with more uncertainty and now they're better off. They live in, a, in Australia and done really well. Different mindset, okay. So, um, the point is, they would have to, and same in your business, what you should do, and same as, same as Greek has, Greece has to do, they have to reduce their wastage, free up some of that money to then invest into growing sales, into growing revenue, because the only way they'll pay down their debt is to grow the economy. So they were able to double their economy, say, in 10 or 20 years. That economy then can afford to sustain the debt levels. Make sense? Same with America. America can't cut and save its way to paying off its deficit. It has to stimulate and grow the economy massively so the debt eventually falls. 
as a smaller percentage of the overall thing. It's just like in, in, in running governments that people think, well, if you make cutbacks, that has to affect services. It's not true. You can slash, like if I was in charge of education in this country, I could slash the cost of education and deliver a better education service. Does it make sense? Because a lack of wastage and inefficiencies. That's what efficiencies and productivity is about. Same thing we see in the bigger picture for managing a country is the same thing you've got to do for managing your company and the same thing you've got to do to manage your own personal finances. You have to earn more than you spend. Pretty basic, isn't it? Okay, and you continually have to look at how to increase your incomes and continually decrease your cost base to be as efficient and as productive as possible. Uh, if you don't, guess what will happen? The market will force it to happen and you'll go broke. Now, some people worry like, uh, you know, that's what you understand in the economy. If people lose their jobs, companies go broke. It's not always a bad thing. You realize that? It's not always a bad thing. Who's ever lost their job? And then turned out it was the best thing that ever happened to them. Okay, Because you have a mindset and a psychology that has you see that where crisis equals opportunity. You might want to jot that down. Chinese proverb, crisis equals opportunity. Uh, and that's what you've got to look at. So you don't have to live in fear of whatever's going to come. Like There's talk coming out of America that America's going to go in a double dip recession and that might be possible and you should be scared. You know, who cares? You don't control. If you get too caught up in that, you don't control the external circumstances. You be aware of it and adjust to it, but you create your own abundance or you create your own recession. And this country has a lot of abundance, but most people are thinking uh, like it's a recession. Very pessimistic. And as a result, we have an economy that's not doing as well as it could. You know, if you're in your business out there, you know, well, it's hard to read the market right now because Australians' fundamentals should be spending more, uh, should be confident more, should be expanding businesses and employing more people, but they're not. So it gets very hard. Last few months, or last six months, in particular ever since the credit crisis, it's really mixed things up where it's harder to get a read, okay? And that creates a lot of uncertainty. When you get a lot of certainty is when you get a boom, when you get things really going because people get super confident. And then people go and spend more, uh, they'll relax more, and they'll focus on making money. Okay? When it goes the other way, people get fearful, they'll hold back. Now, some things, the sense of credit crisis has been great. Australians have saved more money, paid down their debts. That's a good thing. That means they're in a better position to expand again. So these things in the economy, you have to be aware of them. But right now, you always want to focus on how do you create your boom time in your world. Okay, because a lot of wealth has been created out of depression and recessions. So it doesn't have to affect you unless you let it affect you. Does it make sense? It's fear that can over control you. Be aware of it, but don't let fear control you. Now, this would be the same conversation if we're going to be having, being investors. Is it true? Fear and greed. Fear and greed. You have to balance that. Stay calm. If you let the fear overtake you and you stop spending everything, and most mistakes companies make, they cut costs, they cut costs to their marketing and sales. That's the last two places you cut costs. Make sense? You cut costs to your uh, expense areas. Okay? Your last place you cut costs to is marketing and sales because you need to stimulate and grow your business. So it seems like you have to have two things going on at the same time. Part of you has to be a bit scarcity mode and not wasting money and being super efficient. At the same time, the other part of you has to be going, how do I be creative and stimulate and, and, and go on faith and invest and, and hope this works? Who's following what I'm saying? That's why entrepreneurs are some of the highest pay paid people on the planet because it's not easy. It's a different sort of psychology to stay calm. Imagine when you, you have 100 staff if you grow a business or 1,000 staff and you've got all these people you're responsible for. Do you think that adds pressure to you, yes or no? So you have to be able to be good at these things where you can handle pressure and uncertainty. Otherwise, uh, you'll freak out. Okay? You'll freak out and then you'll go into scarcity mode and you'll sabotage and you'll, you won't be successful. So you have to be able to create that certainty within that even when things like you've got companies that might, sales might be tanking, you go, hang on a minute, what do I need to do here? How do I change this? How do I turn this around? The economy is getting tougher. What was working is no longer working. Okay? That's where you have to have your creative thinking on going, okay, let's test different things. Let's do what we're doing this weekend. Let's go and learn off other entrepreneurs. Let's get ideas. Let's get back into creativity mode to create your way out of it. Because okay? the best way to get out of financial problems is to grow your way out of them. Okay? Who's following what I'm saying here?
Okay. Now, some of this might be a little bit advanced for where you're at in some of the businesses, but in any business you have and any individual circumstances, you need to cut costs and manage your cost base. Uh, and then you need to grow. Now, you look at someone like a Nathan Tinkler. Nathan Tinkler, uh, Paul didn't mention, Paul used to uh, be his accountant. But um, Nathan has a, um, Nathan is someone that's very good at creating abundance. Does that make sense? But what Nathan doesn't have, he doesn't have the skill set to manage costs. So Nathan will go and blow $100 million. Now, he obviously, he's been able to afford it in the past. But unless he gets this area under control, he won't be as successful entrepreneur as he could be. He won't sustain himself. Make sense? So, um, because it's great to have the abundance where you just focus on, I'm going to make more money, I'm going to spend heaps because I can just keep on making it. And a lot of entrepreneurs do that because they're good at spending and they blow their fortune. They make it and lose it. They, but they're good at making it, so they make it back again and then they lose it. <laughs> Who's following what I'm saying here? Okay? So they've got this side good at creating wealth, which is a great thing to have, but they haven't managed the other side just to sustain and keep the world. As Tim Ferriss, author for our body, when he was out here, some of you saw him last, last year when he spoke for us, said this, the skill sets it takes to become successful is different to the skill set required to then sustain that success. And it's true. Um, you know, once you're successful and you're doing that, that's take a certain skill set. To sustain success a long time is a whole new ball game. And that's why you see a lot of entrepreneurs make it and lose it and make it and lose it. Okay? What we're trying to teach you here is that's why we also teach you how to be an investor. So you might make it, you're putting some aside, so you've got your diversified incomes and investment. So you can never lose everything and then you protect that and keep them separate. Making sense? So you had that line down the middle. Uh, so you have your personal assets, not just maybe personal, but in your trust, etc. You trust, so you protect it, and then you have your trading companies on the other side of the line and they're growing. But knowing trading companies, even if they're successful, can be sued or something can go wrong, so you're always having both working for you. Making sense? Um, because that's critical. And then your business can rapidly grow your investment strategies. Okay? What you have to balance and say, well, how much cash am I going to put in my investment straight away? Well, I'm going to put into my business to grow and grow and grow and get it big and then pour my money into investments. There's a balance of when you do that. Okay? So, turn the person next to you and then just share with them the two critical things that you've learned so far in this session. And then I'm going to teach you how to grow a business through marketing. Okay, is this making sense so far? Yes or yes? Does anyone have any questions? Any questions so far? Let's start right down the back. Far away with a question. Right down the back row, thanks. Good. All right, I just wanted to um, sort of divert a little bit and just ask you, in your journey, what was the, the biggest mistake you made and what would you do differently if you could do it again? Yeah, I mean, that's a that's good, uh, good question. Um, from a business perspective, I would probably say uh, if, I, well, if I did things differently, I would, at an earlier stage when you're beginning your companies, you'd get an advisory board in place sooner of people that are smarter than you, even if they're only, you know, a lot of people help you out, you know, you know it hasn't cost, doesn't have to cost a lot of money. A lot of people, especially elder um, entrepreneurs, are happy to help up and coming entrepreneurs and maybe, um, give some advice, etc. but you can put an advisory board together. Uh, in some cases, maybe knowing what you know now, you might raise capital earlier in some companies rather than just always risking your own capital. But sometimes in the beginning, you have to prove yourself and then it's easy to raise capital once you have a history of success in business. Um, so there's some of the things I'd do differently. If I was starting out again, I would probably consider being an entrepreneurial manager. In other words, working or consulting to existing companies and helping them grow from where they are to a higher level. Um, say taking a $10 million company to $50 million or a $100 million company to $500 million. That sort of thing, you could make a lot more money with less risk and less time. But of course, to do that, you have to have that skill set. So if you've built your own businesses, you've developed that skill set, or you can develop by working in companies and helping companies do that so you get that skill set. Uh, as far as biggest mistake, uh, let me get back to you on that one. I'd have to think about that one. Um, I would say this being too, one, probably many mistakes, um, being too um, slow to fire, too quick to hire, and too slow to fire. 
That would be one mistake. Definitely most entrepreneurs make that. No one likes firing people, but being too quick to hire because you're in a rush you want to, and you don't hire the best people. The one way to destroy a business is to hire the wrong people. So I would recommend take your time in hiring people. I know you need to get people on board, but especially managers, if you hire a person that's not suited to your company, um, they can cause him so much damage. So the biggest losses I've sustained in companies is having the wrong people. Uh, unfortunately, I have an awesome team, but you know how I built that over years is that we hire predominantly on culture fit. So you want to jot that down. Hire predominantly on culture fit. If the person's not going to fit into your culture, no matter how good they are, it's going to ra- it's going to create problems. Because one, they're not going to f- get along with other people as well, and you're not going to enjoy them having to work with them. Um, so culture fits probably 90%. If you ask Richard Branson, he'd probably say the same. Virgin are big at hiring on culture fit. Uh, Apple, totally culture fit. I mean, if you're working in an Apple store, there's a certain culture fit. You know, you've got to be a geek and know everything. Um, like dealing with geeky stuff and you'll get hired, right? Um, so culture, most companies make mistake not hiring on culture. Um, so uh, that would be a mistake. My mentor always said, my first, me and a mentor, he'd say, um, be slow to hire and quick to fire. And it took me a long time to get that, what that why, he, why he'd always say that. So there, there's some valuable lessons. And some of those already in business had to hire people be learning that the hard way and the slow way. Um, so recruitment is an undervalued resource. Recruitment is critical. So you'd want to recruit better. Uh, as far as payment structure, you know, yeah, sometimes you might want to pay a little bit more to get quality. I'd go for quality over quantity. Sometimes if you're trying to save costs in the beginning, it is hard, and you might try and have you know, too many lower paid people, but you'll attract um, poorer quality, uh, and then you'll need to pay hire more people to do the job where one quality person can often do the job with two or three, so you need to keep that in mind. Um, so I think those things are, are pretty valuable lessons. Um, does that help? Yeah, and I might think of more as we go throughout the weekend, but. Um, I mean, many people here are just starting out, so it's different levels. Some of you, are, half of you got businesses already, so it just depends on what level your business is at, what level it's going to relate to. Any other questions? Well, okay, let's continue. So um, an example here in Melbourne example, I used to live in Docklands a few years back, and um, there's two restaurants there. There's a restaurant that I used to go to all the time, even though it wasn't close by. There was another restaurant that was close by to my building, uh, and it was always empty. Another restaurant, you have to walk a bit further, was always full. So some people blame the economy or they'll blame the local area, Docklands, there's not enough people there or whatever. They'll blame other external circumstances. Yet why is it someone else can have a restaurant in a similar area and absolutely booming? You know, it would serve so many people every day. And that's the difference. So one person has an abundance mentality. The person had a successful, I've even forget his name, otherwise I'd give him a plug. Um, but it's, it's a great restaurant. But he's there, he gets to know everyone personally, uh, he, he's passionate, he stands outside, introduces, welcomes people as they come in. He loves what he does. I mean, it's, it's, he's, he loves it. He's got a booming business. The other restaurant, hardly anyone there, ever. I don't know how it's still in business. Struggles. So it's not so much to, the external things are not the things that generally will determine your success. It's the internal things, true? And that's what's exciting about that is that you are the reason you'll make millions of dollars or you are the reason you will not make millions of dollars. Now, that can be motivating or it can be depressing. Okay? <laughs> Depends the way that you look at it. That's why education, skill set, um, environment, etc., is critical. And it's true what uh, Paul mentions, that proximity is power. Um, one of the greatest business lessons I got, why well, I was, you know, probably six, seven years ago, I might be longer now, I'd never met a billionaire before. And so I'd already become a millionaire and I'm doing quite well, but you always can want to hang around people that are doing better than you. So I put it out there, I put the intention out there, I want to meet a billionaire. And literally within six months, I was invited to um, to meet some uh, billionaires, uh, foreign billionaires. And um, they'd heard about me and through different people I knew and they were interested in investing a lot of money into Australia and that's how they heard about me and wanted to you know, meet and learn about what we do in Australia. 
and I was invited to uh, there were Russian billionaires and go to go to Russia um, to you know because the way they do business is that they want to um, they are all about relationships they they only do business with you once they get to know you so they'll build a relationship first uh, and then you know so they'll celebrate they'll they'll take you to restaurants so. Uh, they will lay it all on to really build a relationship. And then, if they like you, they'll do business with you at the end. In Australia, we'll tend to do the business first, and if it works out well, then we'll go out and celebrate with a beer. Do you know what I'm saying? So it's like the reverse. And Asian is a, and Asia's a lot like that too in China and stuff. They'll want to drink with you, get to know you before they'll ever do business with you. So it was a great experience because the, they had built you know, uh, many, many companies and many, some of that employed tens of thousands of people. So they walked me over a week. I call it billionaire boot camp. I got to go and hang out with these guys and travel through Russia and sit down with their boards of their different companies and see their companies. So it was the greatest lesson I ever got. <coughs> Excuse me. Because when you're looking at other people's businesses, it's the best training you can get for your own business because you're thinking, my God, I could do this differently. I could have a better team in place. I could have a board in place. I could have better structure. I could raise capital maybe for some companies. Um, I could diversify more, et cetera. So that was one of what I call BNA boot camp. So by hanging around billionaires, it increases your, your income just by proximity is power. Mindset is different. They said to me at the time, um, they didn't speak that much English, so I had a translator. They said, Jamie, Currently, your current strategy, how long will it take you to be a billionaire? When I first met them, this was at lunch in Sydney. <coughs> and I actually had never thought of about becoming a billionaire, so I had no written down goal plan to do that. So I said, I don't know, maybe 15, 20, 30, 40 years, maybe never. Um, they said, well, why don't you do it in three years? I said, why don't you take more drugs? <laughs> But that was a different mindset. So in other words, and what it did was plant the seed to go, okay, you want to think on a bigger scale. If I was to become a billionaire, how would I do it? And, and at the time, I had a bit of an idea. You know, people become billionaires, I'll teach you tomorrow or, or Monday when you chance about the BNS strategy. Um, so it planted the seed, but it got me thinking on a bigger scale. And my businesses grew a lot after that um, by, you know, just raising your level of thinking and hanging around people that are playing the game. Now, they, for them, <coughs> you know, because in some of those emerging economies, you can create wealth very rapidly. So there's people that have become billionaires in five years or less, okay, um, that have switched to entrepreneurs. So, so they have a different paradigm. I mean, in China, the amount of billionaires there is, or people worth hundreds and hundreds of millions of dollars. So um, you understand there's a tremendous amount of wealth in the world. Even in, in America, you know, the economy's been struggling there. There's still a, a copious amounts of wealth and opportunity. Um, so for an entrepreneur, the world's exciting. If you're focused and confident and got your finances taken care of where you can manage your cost base, you can go out in the world with confidence and do well. So a few other things that's, let's get into. Um, before we get into the marketing, I'll share a quick story of, I had a friend, this is many years ago, probably eight, ten years ago, he moved from Sydney. He was a chef. And he moved from Sydney to Noosa. I was living in Noosa at the time. And... Um, I told him about some strategy about investing in real estate. He bought a couple of properties. He was making money. And, um, and he, he wasn't happy with his career. He wanted to do more than just be a chef working in a kitchen. He wanted to make more money. He didn't mind being a chef, but he just was frustrated that he wasn't getting paid a lot of money. And I said, well, if you want to expand your money, I said to him, I said, do you know other chefs that make more money than you? And he said, of course. And you tell me, who's other chefs that make more than the average chef? Jamie Oliver's one. Who else? Gordon Ramsay. Uh, overseas, there's others. So in other words, because what I'm trying to get him, I'm not trying to tell him the answer. I'm trying to get him to come up and think of the answer. So as I'm sharing this story, I'm not sharing the story for the sake of sharing a story. I'm sharing the story because there's many valuable lessons in this about how many of you can increase your income dramatically if you get the points throughout the story. If you forget the points throughout the story, you probably won't increase your income. So I said to him, and he said, oh, yeah, Jamie Oliver, et cetera. And he's like thinking, what's this guy? What's the point to where I'm going? I said, well, I said, why do they earn more money than the average chef? Like, let's say Jamie Oliver earns $10 million a year. The average chef earns, what, 60000 a year? So I'd say, is it because he's 20 times better chef, yes or no? no he might be 
He might even be better than some of the other chefs. He might be slightly better, certainly not 20 times. So I've got you thinking, why, do they, why does he earn so much more money? You've got this, here's what I understand. You've got the same skill set. You're a chef, exact same skill set. Just like many of you in this room have a skill set that someone else in this country has the exact same skill set and is earning 250000 or earning a million dollars or more a year. You have the same skill set. Why are they earning more money than you? Is the question what you should be thinking about. So I said to him, you know, why are they earning more money? What makes them so much money? What are they doing differently? So you tell me, why is Jamie Oliver making more money than the average chef? See if you can figure it out. Brand, brand he has a brand. He's built a brand. Branding is value. We learned that today. Build a brand. Okay, that's true. So he's focused on a, building a community and giving back. That would be true. Certainly is. Yep. What's that? Sorry. He's a celebrity. Yes, that helps. That helps with the branding. Lots of followers. But remember, he wasn't a celebrity to start with. He has lots of followers. But you know, what are some else? What are some else things that he's doing differently to the average chef? Let me ask you a question. How does the average chef earn his money? His or her money? They have to be in a kitchen in the back of a restaurant and sell their what? They sell their time, is it true? My average chef is selling their time for probably 50, 60 hours a week for like 50 to 100K a year. True? Unless they're a really good chef, they might be earning more. They're selling their time. That's the only way they have to be there to earn their income. Jamie Oliver, does he have to be in the back of a restaurant cooking to earn his income, yes or no? No, he's probably earning income while he sleeps, true? So how does he earn his income? What is he selling? Books, recipes, magazines, DVDs, TV shows. He has restaurants as well, true? Yep, but he would have them leveraged. TV shows he'd be making money from. In other words, he's not selling his time. He's selling a what? He's selling a product. He's selling a result. And the way he's doing that is through products. He would have a cooking, and no doubt you could buy cooking utensils that would be branded with Jamie Oliver, no doubt. So products, he's selling a result by selling a product, or in some cases he's selling a service as well. Does it make sense? Most people in Australia have a skill set, but they're selling it where they have to show up to a desk to get paid for that same skill set. And we're not just talking about chefs here, okay? where the people that earn a lot of income, they have expanded their revenues by shifting to selling a result and selling a product or service. Because there's only so much of you, 40, there's only so many hours in a week you can sell here, but uh, um, Jamie Oliver can sell unlimited cookbooks, is that true? He could sell unlimited monthly subscriptions to, I don't know whether he has it, but he, that's a business where he could easily do, charge a monthly subscription for teaching people valuable recipes and how to cook online. Who would pay a monthly subscription um, to learn off Jamie Oliver in this room? It depends how much it was, but it was like 20 bucks or 30 bucks or 50 bucks a month. If you're into cooking and you could subscribe to him and he would give you videos of all these latest recipes and how to cook and do that, heaps of people around the world would do that. Does it make sense? So he's still cooking in front of a camera, but as a result through TV or through YouTube or through internet, he can reach a lot of people. See, he's made it easier for people to um, benefit from his social mission in life, okay? To add value, he's adding value, but he can reach a lot more people because he's used much more effective mediums to reach those People. Does it make sense? Where my friend in Noosa, the only way someone can, he can add value to their lives is they have to come to the restaurant he works at. And they would not, still not even get to meet him. They wouldn't build his brand. That's the only way. So it's such a limited way. He's made it so difficult for himself to add value to society. Where Jamie Oliver's made it so accessible, so easy for people to access him and so much easier for him to add value to society. What does this have to do with you? Well, every one of you in this room has a skill set that it's taken you years, no doubt, to get good at, whatever you do in your job, career, or business. There's other people that would like to know how you do that. Uh, or there's other, that's the one way you could sell your skill set to people that want to replicate what you've done in your career. Okay. Or you do you, your existing skill set, you sell your product or services in a bigger way, 
rather than if you're an accountant, you have a skill set. Is that true? So if you're just selling your skill set by one-on-one -on -one consultations and that's your only way of reaching people, then you would be reducing your income. But if you, like Paul Sidorowski, has 30 accountants working for him. Does that make sense? So he has an accounting business where he has people at work and leverage. So they are working whether he's there or not. He's also the entrepreneur. Remember he said he's an entrepreneur that runs an accounting business. So it's very rare to find an accountant that's an entrepreneur. There's usually two different skill sets. That's why most accountants are bloody useless. Okay? Because they don't have an entrepreneurial or investor mindset. I mean, how much more will you pay for an accountant that understands investing and business? They're the accountants you want. You don't want an accountant that is a bureaucrat, is just a pen pusher, that has a very poor psychology. Why do you think most financial planners are useless? Because they, they don't have an investor psychology. There's no, they can't add value. Making sense? So whether you're an accountant, whether you're an electrician, whether you're a doctor, a plumber, you have a skill set, how do you expand it? Well, you expand it the same way Jamie Oliver has, by leveraging his income, by making it available, more available. Now, this leads to the internet and social media because now there's platforms that anyone can share their skill set to the world quite easily. In, for free in most cases, yes. To build a brand. Does it make sense? So I said to my friend, I said, have you ever thought about writing a cookbook? He said, yeah, I thought about it, but I never got around to it. And here's the challenge. He won. And he's thinking about how to make extra income. I said, do you enjoy cooking? Yes, I love cooking. Would you enjoy creating your own cookbook? Yeah, I'd love doing that. So why don't you do it? Oh, but what if I fail? See, this is a problem. People worry about failure. What if it doesn't work? Jot this down. Who gives a shit? If you're passionate about something and you enjoy it, should you not do it anyhow and give it to the world? Does that add more value? Does it start building your community, your fans, whether you make money from it or not? Because that's the reason the highest paid people on the planet will do what they do for nothing. And as a result, they generally get paid millions of dollars a year. Ask Jamie Oliver, would he do TV shows for nothing? He'd probably say, yeah, I love it. It's enjoyable cooking. Why not? Something I do, a piece of cake for me. Of course I do it. But the poorest people on the planet, guess what? If you ask them to do something for nothing, guess what they'll say? No. Go shove it. They won't work an extra five minutes unless there's something in it for them. Make sense? That's why they're poor. What am I saying? I'm saying you need to add more value. You need to share your skill set with the world. Make it more easily accessible. And there's many role models to do this. We're not just using the chef example for chefs. It's an example that can apply to almost any industry. Repeat after me. Mm, something to think about. Expand and make it more about. But, but what about this? What about that? Who cares if he ever made any money from it? It's something he loves. But because he doesn't put his heart and soul into it, there's a fair chance if he got savvy with internet marketing, social media, put it online, he could actually turn that into making money. Or what he could do it by giving it away, he could build a following. Once you build a big enough following, a big enough brand, then he could then monetize that in many other ways that you're going to learn this weekend. Making sense? It all starts with that first step. As a coach, I've helped many people become millionaires. And, you know, it's not hard to be a coach. If people come and talk to me and, you know, I get, you know, it's funny, if I go overseas, I often get swamped. If I was in Russia the last two times, I've been invited on TV. Every time they find that I'm there, they want interview. Relentlessly, I was in India and people come and ask for your autograph. Because in these emerging countries, they read the books, okay? Around the, the, I get messages every day. And pretty much now in Australia, everywhere I walk, I'll get pulled up at the airport or at restaurants and, and um, people come over and chat. And by the way, can, I'm doing this and what do you think, you know? Um, so I'm usually giving him free financial advice over dinner, try and have a beer. Um, but I'm happy to talk. I talk to people all the time, um, which was leading me up to a, an important point I was going to share with you. Now, something else. There's a, there's a reason I share stories. I don't share them just to talk. Oh, yeah, coaching. I say that. So to coaching, it's not hard to be a coach because, you know, all I have to do when people share their idea or what they want to do, I say, well, when are you going to do it? Why haven't you done it? When are you going to start? Tell me when you're going to start. Message me when you've started. 
All I have to do to get people successful is get them to do it. Does it make sense? Because the only difference between those that fail in life and those that are successful, the only defining factor in 20 years of my studies of success, the only defining factor is, at the end of the day, be both equally intelligent. Some people just do it. Others still thinking about it. Making sense? Yeah, and you know it would be true in this room. You're action takers. You get out there and do things. That's what it comes down to. So it's just getting ourselves committed. That's why a coach is often good. Getting ourselves, okay, we thought about this idea. We'll just do it. Now, people, why they don't do it, some reason, times they don't know how to do it. Fair enough. Or other times they're afraid of what? Failure. Failure. Now, my friend, I haven't caught up with him for many years, so he didn't actually follow through and do it. He's still working in a restaurant. Okay, He's made money out of the property stuff that I taught him to do. Um, but the point is, now this is probably eight, ten years ago. Imagine if he did start then, and it was his passion. He was happy to do it for no money. How big of a following or business on the side could he have possibly built in the last decade? There's a fair chance he could have made a lot of money. But even if he didn't, would he be proud of the things, cookbooks and videos and, and fun things he would have built? He would have, could have done it for free now with YouTube and all this stuff. If he's doing it, it's a hobby. You just do it. You can't fail if you go, you know what? I'm going to do it anyhow because it's something I believe in. It's something I believe in. I'll do it anyhow. Any money I get is a bonus. But when you come from that space and you put your heart and soul into something, remember, society rewards what? Passion. passion. If you're passionate, he's a passionate cook. He loves what he does. He creates great videos and he helps you and people out there in they come up with great ways to cook meals, which is a great trend, by the way. Have we not seen the last few years? Master Chef and all of these. There's a, a rising trend. He could have tapped into that trend and could have built an empire if he wanted to. He learned all these skill sets. Okay? The most searched thing on Google is recipes and chicken recipes at that. <laughs> Do you know that? So is that a trend? I mean, the point is is that you have to start that first step. So if you don't even know how to do this stuff, you're going to learn a lot this weekend. But I would not be waiting. Like I talk to so many people and they're like, well, um, okay, well, you want to start a business. I go, okay, well, this is the coaching I give to some of my friends. And it's like, okay, well, great. Did you know about WordPress? Okay, I want you to go tonight. Do your homework. Start your website tonight. They've just mentioned an idea of a business they want to do. I go, well, what are you waiting for? Start it tonight and tell me tomorrow it's done. Set up a fan page on Facebook, start it and do it. Oh no, I'll do it. No, no you got, if you're going to do something, do it today. So if you get ideas today or tomorrow, start it. If I get an idea, like yesterday, you know, I've knew, in our media company, 20th Century Media, we produce magazines, and I was talking to the team about you know, all these other future magazines we're going to create, like Me and Our Inc., Rich Inc., all possible names, Business Inc., Money Inc., you know, Success Inc. And so we're talking about all these ideas and brainstorming. So I don't just talk about it. In the meeting, I email uh, to my marketing department and go, OK, can you quickly go and register all these domains in case we use them in the future? Does that make sense? Now, if I wanted to launch some of those titles, I could get them starting to build a website, WordPress. Within a day or a couple of days, they could have a website built. The point is, if you're going to do something, do it. These days with social media and internet, well, but I don't know how to build a website. It doesn't matter. You don't even have to know how to build a website. That's what people overseas in the Philippines will do for you. Okay, well, websites now, well, you can build them yourselves without HTML. There's all this new stuff that's out there. So it's getting started is the hardest part. Because once you get started, you get momentum, you learn what's working. And if you're not looking at it as failure, you're looking at it as learning experience. What have you got to worry about? What have you got to lose? People are like, oh, I would try a new business. What if it doesn't work? They're worried about the embarrassment of their friends if it doesn't work or whatever. What have you got to lose in new businesses these days? You're not putting up a lot of capital. You have nothing to lose. So don't see it as failure. Seize an opportunity to learn and grow. So if you guys are serious about tapping into a lot of new technology and, and internet businesses and things this weekend, you want to start before you finish Monday. You want to get your WordPress site up and running. You want to get your Google accounts and testing and Facebook accounts and running ads if you want to test new advertising. And that's the only way you'll learn. That's how I learned. And uh, so, making sense? There's no excuses. No, I'll think about it, do it one day, bullshit, you won't do it now. Do it now, okay? That's why I have my iPhone in seminars and I'm emailing. Now, admittedly, if you delegate, you don't have to do it all yourself. 
You know, you're good at delegating. Entrepreneurs, that's what many of you have to also, I'll, maybe if I get time this weekend, I'll go through some of that time management system. If I don't, it's on DVD. If you're an entrepreneur in this room, you, if you want to be more productive and efficient, it doesn't matter who you are, more productive and efficient, you have to manage your time better. And the most successful and wealthiest people on the planet are very good at delegating. Very good at delegating. I don't do things for myself. Does that make sense? Now I can because I've had to do it in the past. But why would I wash the dishes? Not to be arrogant, but why would I wash the dishes? It's a $10 an hour activity. In Australia, it's $17 an hour. <laughs> why would I do that unless it's a form of meditation that enhances my life, which is unlikely. I'm better off paying someone else to wash the dishes so I can go and create $10,000 an hour in wool. You know what I'm saying? Why would I mow the lawn when you can outsource that? So what are you doing mowing the lawn and washing the dishes if you want to get rich? Okay, does it make sense? Stop wasting time. I know you might have spouses that tell you to take the garbage out. Tell them you've got more important things to do. <laughs> you get divorced, it'll cost you millions. Do you not understand what I'm saying now? You have to value your time because if you don't value it, other people won't. For instance, in business, if you ask anyone, I mean, I have you know, a dozen companies, but I have business partners everywhere. Imagine if I, just, if I spoke on the phone. A lot of people like talking on the phone. I don't. Okay? I'm visual. I like to see people. I'm not very auditory. I find it hard to communicate. If all I can hear, I can't see. Um, well, it's just Skype these days. But I've used Skype once in my life. The point is, if I spoke to every business partner that I have, in each of my companies, then I would get nothing done but speak all day on the phone. I don't speak on the phone. So if I start a new company, a new business partner, I quickly educate them that they have to SMS me or email me. Don't Skype me, don't phone me, because you can phone, I'm not gonna answer the phone. Because I don't have time for that. Because I can send 20 emails a time and do one or two phone calls. And the phone calls usually have to go back to an email anyhow to document what the meeting was about. True? Not all the time. Sometimes phone calls can be handy to, but if it's going to be a phone call, it'd be a preset meeting that's already been discussed in email, what it's going to be about, preset meeting to get something co covered in that meeting. Does that make sense? I, I don't do that many meetings either. I was going to write a book years ago, How to Run Companies Without Meetings, because most companies have too many meetings. Committees and meetings and nothing happens. You've got to have a balance, but is you don't want to be tied up in just not doing stuff. So I use technology as much as I can, to be efficient. So one of the reasons I can travel, run dozens of companies and have lots of free time is I'm very good with my time. And I'm very good at delegating. So you have to have a good team and that takes time. In the beginning, most of us are perfectionists. We're like, well, I, could, I might as well do it myself because at least I know it'll get done. Who's ever said that before? Okay, I might as well do it myself. We all had that element of perfection in, in, in us, but you're never going to create much wealth unless you can learn to train others to do things they may not be as good as you, but it's just like Richard Branson says, you've got to allow people to make mistakes. He's very big on don't criticize your staff ever. Highlight to them what they've done well. Look for things they've done well and reinforce what they do well. Okay, there's all different techniques. I mean, um, Richard Branson's like that, but he's built a very good culture. Steve Jobs was highly critical and highly demanding, but still successful. So there's different personalities, different ways of doing it, but reassure them of the good things they do. Highlight what they don't do right, but reassure them the good things that they do. So they, it's a positive message for them. And allow an environment where people can make mistakes, but try and minimize the cost. Because generally people only make a mistake once. Okay? They'll learn a lot from that. Okay? So, you've got to have, so you have to have that ability to be a trainer in your organization so you have people that can do it because you can't be doing everything. And if you're trying to do everything, you're never going to get rich. You need to be able to go, how can I delegate, outsource, have other people take over some of the workload? Because you have to be the Richard Branson of your business. You have to be focused on the PR, the strategy, working on it, new ideas, being creative, being happy and friendly, a team morale, team boosting uh, you know, things for your team, throwing a party, celebrating, enjoying it, motivating the troops. You can't go out there and fight the war yourself. You have to be coordinating that. Making sense? Very good. Okay. Shall we continue? Yes. Who's learning some things? Yeah. Yeah. Okay. So let's look at um, how do we go about marketing? The world has changed. 
The world has changed, but some fundamentals of marketing haven't. It depends what industry you're in. But we don't talk a lot about social media this weekend. I don't personally claim to be a social media expert. Um, however, I use other people and my team that have to be and, and learning those things. And it's a constant thing. What we could teach on social media today could change in six months. But I'll teach you the marketing fundamentals because they haven't changed. How do you grow a business at low cost or no cost? Jot this down. We'll draw this. What I'm going to share with you is what I call the marketing funnel. What's it called? And you can add this to most businesses. There's always exceptions, but you've got to work at the exception. Business is about a marketing funnel. At the top of the funnel, you want to fill the funnel with lots of what? Or what are we going to call prospects? Potential clients, prospects. And down here is the funnel is going to come out and you're going to have a customer or customers, okay? They're going to go through the funnel. So you have to create a marketing funnel. Now here's the challenge for most people. They're in business, they start off, they don't have many prospects or many customers, so they're really desperate. If you're really, guys, if you're trying to date a girl when you're at school and you're really desperate and clingy and, and you know, what does it do to the opposite sex? Pushes them away, okay? So you have to be opposite to that. You want to have so many prospects and so many potential girlfriends, okay, that you have choice, true? True. You know, if we change it the other way, that's what you want to have. You want to have choice. So you want to be in a position of strength to negotiate. If you're in a position uh, of weakness, you can't negotiate. So most people are desperate and will take on any client, especially in their new business, because they're like, I've got to make revenue. I've got to pay the, the salaries. I've got to cover the costs. I've got to make a profit. True. But you want to change that around. You want to be and say, you know what? I'm going to build a community but I'm only going to work with certain type of people. It's my business, it's my life, you're gonna spend a lot of time at it, so I want a business I enjoy. I want a business I, I'm going to work with decent people, people with similar values, and you would set a criteria for that. But what you wanna do is get yourself in a position of strength, so you wanna have that many potential prospects that wanna deal with you, okay? that many potential ones that then you can go, you know what, I can't work with them all in my company, whatever your product or service is, so I'm going to have to be selective and I'm going to work with ones that meet this criteria. Making sense? Is that completely opposite to how most people do business? Most people are like, they're trying to chase every customer down, they're wondering why they're running away, they're, they're in sales and they're harassing people and they run away. It's not the way to do business. It's not an effective way. Sure, you have to um, chase and get out there and hustle for business, but you want to create an environment where you are in control. And the way you do that is have so many potential clients that you can't work with them all. So then you say, you know what, I'm only going to work with X, Y, Z client. Okay, and what you can do is you can rate your clients. Now, if you already have a business, you want to do this anyhow. Okay, so you might have your marketing funnel but what you want to do is rate your clients A, B, C, or D. Now, A clients might be the clients that have plenty of money. They're not going to worry about price. They've got the money. They want your product or service. They always pay on time, and they're a real joy to work with. They're your A type clients. Okay? B clients might be very close, similar. Maybe you don't pay as quickly, but you're happy to have them. C clients might be they bitch and moan about the prices. Um, they whinge all the time. They take up all customer service time and uh, they pay late. You probably don't want them, okay? So what you want to do is grade your clients and first of all, you know who is your client? Jot that down. Who is your client? All right, now here's a common question, people, what common comment many people go, Jamie, everyone is my client. Who's your target market? Oh, everyone is my target market. That's why they're not successful. And everyone's not your target market. And everyone's not your client, so get over it. If you can't narrow it down, one thing I learned off Russell Kogan, he sells TVs right online. You, he's someone that could say, oh, Jamie, everyone's my target market. No, Russell is successful because he goes down to the smallest niche. He is segmented his market so well. He doesn't chase everyone. He chases niche after niche after niche in such a specific way. 
absolute detail, using Facebook, etc. in particular, to identify and get a message to that particular market, which will be a different message to a different market. Does it make sense? You have to be niche, jot that word down, specific niche. You have to be so detailed and go for your target market. Now, there might be several target markets, but you've got to know who is your client. The second question is, who has your clients as well? Who has your clients already? We'll cover that in a moment because we're going to look at how to you know, some of these ideas I'm about to go through in this session um, can, we're talking double, quadruple your sales overnight if you apply them to many businesses because you have so many hidden assets in your businesses, you're just not thinking. And this is why most businesses, they just don't understand and they do all this hard work for a little return when they can do no extra effort, but just doing things differently and make a lot more profit. Okay, I'm not saying it's easy, but we're talking quantum changes just by one of these ideas. So really stay with it and thinking, how can you apply this to your business or other businesses? Okay. So you're going to keep your A and B clients. You've decided who they are. Your C clients, what you're going to do is send them to your competitors. Are you saying I would send clients to your competitors? Absolutely. Because you don't want them. Let them send your competitors broke. Send them there. Say, sorry, uh, we no longer will deal with you. To deal with us, you have to be an A or B client. If you're willing to become an A or B client, this is what the conditions, what you have to meet. We'll keep you. If you're not, we know there's another company we highly recommend you go and do business with. And better still, you can go to your competitors and say, look, if we send you some clients, will you give us a referral fee? Yes or no? Absolutely. So you can send clients to them and get paid a commission and they'll go broke servicing them. Or they'll have the headache because they're probably desperate and will work with anyone. I mean, do you really want to work with someone that's desperate? No. And D clients where you just sack them and send them to your competitors as well. Make sense? That's a different way. Now, some of you are dealing, because some of you are stressed because you've got a business that you don't like dealing with certain customers. Why are you putting up with certain customers? Sack them or charge them more. So the other thing you could say, okay, if you're going to, because if someone's a headache client, you can either say, well, I'm going to sack you. You say it politely, you're fired. <laughs> or if you're going to do business, you can just charge them more so then they can sack themselves. They'll either pay more so you can put up with dealing with them or they sack themselves. They'll go elsewhere. Make sense? So that's where, jot this word down, segmenting. You're also going to, when you say who's your target market, you may have different target markets. You're going to segment. Some target markets want to pay a high price for your product or service. Others don't. So you've got to say, who do you want to go after? The mistake most people go after is you want to, here's how you shortcut it. You want to go for a business that already has demand. demand. Okay, most people focus, they come up with a great product, they fall in love with their own product, and they're like, wow, I'm going to spend all this time and money. They'll raise some money or they'll put their own money into it. And they'll spend six, 12 months. And they, they're kind of procrastinating because they're doing everything to get it ready. But they, they don't want to test whether it's going to work because they're trying to avoid subconsciously failure, the pain of failure. So they're doing everything and spending all their time and money in this product or service to get it ready. And they're in love with it. They're in love with it. Okay? And they don't test and measure it for ages. Big mistake. What you want to do is you want to know there is a market already for your product or service before you start it. You want to find the market first, then create a product or service to fit that market. Making sense? You do it in reverse. You're reducing your odds uh, of failing dramatically because you already discovered the market. Then you create the product or service for the market, not the other way around. Because now you already know there's a market for it. You've already tested that beforehand. Okay? You've already tested before, and you can even test sell a product before you've even created it on Google and Facebook. Just put little ads up for the product, what it might be called, and test the different price. Yeah, you say, I haven't even got the product, so it doesn't matter. People click on the ads, and you see which ads they like the most. You're test selling. If there's enough demand for it, you go, oh, now I'll go and put the effort into creating the product. If there's no demand for it, which thank God I didn't waste time and energy on that. 
Could have wasted the whole year creating something no one wants to buy. Who's following what I'm saying? You're doing it. You're being smart. You're doing it from the opposite end. Okay, find the market first. Create the product for the market. Okay, and test and measure straight away. Test and measure straight away or up front. Don't waste six or 12 months on something that you don't know is going to work and you're scared to see whether it's going to work because you don't want to have to admit failure. Fail early, fail fast means test, measure quickly. Will it work? Will it work? Won't work? No. Well, it might work, but you have to keep on changing, 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 fine tuning to bang, you get it to work. Then when you get it to work, then you scale up. Does it make sense? That's when you scale up. Once you've got a system in place, you scale up. I've seen many companies, I've done it myself in some of mine years ago, is that trying to grow a company too fast. Some companies grow too fast, they fall over. You're better off slowing it down in the beginning, get it working nice, get the systems in place, get the back out, get things working, then you scale up and leverage, okay? If you're just trying to grow too rapidly because you just want to push things, push things, it's not sustainable and it'll often fall over. Or you get one chance sometimes at a market. One chance. Like if Facebook, when it was starting to grow, if it went down for a day or two, it would have meant the end of it, we would have stopped using because we all would have went, it's unreliable. Blackberry as an example. When Blackberry has gone down a few times, how many customers have they lost? Networks down, people on Blackberry, the whole of North America can't message each other back in the days when everyone was on Blackberry. You only have to do that a few times and you're gone. Okay? So you often only get one shot of the market. So you don't go out in a big way to the market with your offer and you can't handle the demand. Vodafone. Okay, Vodafone, yep. They've been a classic case. So you get one shot at the market. So you test, measure, and then you gradually build up. You're building a sustainable business okay, over time. You're not trying to, it's no race. And then things will grow better because the customers have a better experience, okay? Uh, and then you'll have less headache. So there's no perfect business. And as consumers, we're imperfect as well. As a consumer, we expect very high things from a company. But if it's our own company, we know in reality, you can't always deliver that because it's not possible. Because you're dealing with people, there's things are going to go wrong. That's just life. So we have to be a little bit flexible. As an entrepreneur, if you're not flexible, you're going to get bent out of shape. You have to be flexible. You also have to be able to deal with all sorts of personalities. So if you're the entrepreneur, uh, even if you're a manager, you have to get good at dealing with people. Richard Branson, as an example, very good entrepreneur because he can deal with a lot of personalities. He's able to get along with most people. That's a, that, don't underestimate the value of that skill set. Okay? If you don't like people, well, that can be a problem if you're going to be in a business where you have to deal with people. Okay? And there is some people like that, just don't like people. Making sense so far? So how are we going to fill the top of this bucket with prospects or potential clients for you, any company? How are you going to do it? You're going to give something away for what? Free. free. Jot this down. You give stuff away for free. How hard is that? Now, those over 30 in the room will go, well, Jamie, there's no such thing as a free lunch. There has to be a catch to something for free. Because those over 30 would think, well, that's the way it used to be. Nothing's for free. Those under 30 years of age will go, yeah, I get free shit all the time on the internet. I, I not only expect it, I, I, I'm entitled to it. <laughs> There's no catch. It's free. You download it. It's free. That's just the way the world is, isn't it? It's always been like that. <laughs> Make sense? So you've got two different markets there. The older people will be more skeptical. Oh, what's this? Free must be some catch to it. Younger people are like, yep, we'll take that with no issues. Making sense? The internet, the race to zero, that article I wrote some time ago, the internet's caused the race to zero. A lot of things are now free. So that's created a lot of opportunity. Uh, it's brought prices down. Why are secondhand cars cheaper now? Internet. Because now you can go on the internet and you can see what all the other prices of similar car are. So it's harder for people in the old days. You could charge a lot more because access to that information wasn't available. You don't know whether it's a good deal or not. Now, boom. So, so many industries have been turned upside down because of the free model. And we'll give you, we'll go through some examples. Um, they will give you, um, I don't know whether they've given to you already, the, um, uh, the business manual for this weekend. Did they email it out to you? Yeah, so if you didn't get an email, so it's a PDF, so you can, but some of these examples, in a lot, you know, there's, a whole, there's a lot of templates, there's a lot of stuff in there for you guys. Um, but, you know, such as, you know, 
50 different business models built on free. So as far as I'll go, go through some of them uh, in a moment, but you know, there's a lot of style that you can go through as far as actual details of ideas of successful businesses that are not only giving something away for free to generate a customer, but these days by giving their whole service away for free are uh, very successful companies. Let's look at Google as an example. How much have you paid to search on Google? Nothing. Uh, you're part of the Google community. You're a, you're a fan or you use their service. They've never asked you once for money. They've built a whole business on free. They give their service away for free, but they charge advertisers to advertise on there. Does it make sense? And they reshape the whole advertising industry. Google turns over a billion dollars in sales in Australia alone. Okay, hugely successful model. So, but generally in traditional business, we'll give it away for free to get massive demand. Then we have the filters. So out of that, we have, now, what can you give away for free? Well, you can give, tell me, what can you give away for free in your business or businesses? Information. Information about your business, a free uh, report on how to um, save electricity, or if you're an electrician, a free report how to save electric electricity, and then it could go into by having the proper plugs and systems in your house, etc. You can save money, and at the end of it, it leads to contacting them. Does it make sense? Because you've given away something for free, a valuable report, you get people's interest, and they go, oh, this is really good, I know how to save some money, I might give them a call and get that installed. Making sense? What else can you give away for free? What else? DVDs. Books, DVDs. Has anyone got a free book? Okay. What else? Free consultation, free coaching, uh, free trial. Software is very big on that. Free trial, download a free trial or free app. If you like it, you might then pay for the more premium app. Does that make sense? But they're building a community, a database. Angry Birds, has that been a successful game? Yes or no? Yeah, they made so much money though. Um, uh, my friend caught up with the founder in LA recently and uh, they were saying that they no, long, no longer bother uh, improving or coming out with extra games of Angry Birds. I mean, they've had a billion downloads. I mean, they've got a billion customers. That's not a bad community because they make so much money now for merchandise because every other product wants to use the Angry Birds across clothes and toys and everything. They're making so much money out of merchandise and licensing now, they couldn't be bothered doing much as far as creating any more uh, Angry Bird games. I mean, they're hugely profitable. And something so simple like that. Now, interesting about that, it was their 50-second game that they created, Angry Birds was. And uh, so they did 51 games that weren't that successful. And the 50-second game, they created Angry Birds. And he noticed when he tested it, uh, his mother was using it. And she's like, and she does not even a geek and was enjoying it, and he knew he was onto something. It's like, wow, if my mother even likes this, Angry Birds could be popular, and boom. You know, hugely successful. Um, what else can you give away? Free samples of your products? Yep. Free quotes? Anything else? Free seminar, free, seminar, free newsletters. What's that? Yeah, merchandise, things like that. So what you're doing is generally, now every business is in the information business. Is that true? It doesn't matter what business you have. You are, you'd have a website or a Facebook fan page and uh, you would have some form of information you've got to give away to um, let people know about what you do. So the best way, jot this down, the best sell is what we call educational sell. You should be educating your clients. In any industry, it should be educating your clients. You're, once again, you're adding value. You're coming from, jot this down, uh, trusted advisor. You know, I think Paul used those words, trusted advisor. If you establish credibility, you come from a trusted advisor, so you're there to advise and assist your community, your clients, your, your fans, okay? So you're coming from that perspective in whatever industry that you do, okay? Um, so you're giving away free things to build up this and then you're going to filter them. Then what people will do is from the free X percentage of those um, free uh, prospects will then buy your product or service. So your product might be product one, okay, whatever it is, and they will buy that product or service. Makes sense? And you start making money. The key is to fill up this funnel here 
So you have a lot automatically purchasing. So jot this down. One, you want to do a lot in business automation. Okay. Now with the internet, creates a lot of automation automatically. Okay, I bought some flowers two days ago. Now, online. So I can do some things myself, right? And I was amazed. What a perfect business model. Flowers, you know, all flower stores, most of their orders now, I don't know the stats, I dare say a majority of their orders are online. Go online, select where you want the flowers sent, somewhere near that area, enter your credit card details, select the flower package, and boom, done. And it's like so simple. I'm thinking, what a great business. Do you know Domino's now get something like 54% of their orders for pizza is online? Who orders pizza online already? You download the app and wait. Why it saves you time, etc. Whoever thought pizza could be an automated internet business? It's phenomenal. What the internet, because we now become internet savvy thanks to um, smartphones. Predominantly now with smartphones, we can order off our phone. Um, so that's really changing the world. So as businesses, we really have to adapt to the future trends. Uh, if you don't have a website, well, that you're just you know just not in business. If you don't have a Facebook fan page, you're just not in your in your business isn't on Facebook or Twitter. You're not really in business. So you have to be up with the trends. And we used to be our grandchildren would go to see our grandparents for wisdom. Now it's the grandparents uh, going to see their grandkids to know how to turn a computer on or what's this Facebook thing. Okay. So the world has changed. Um, one of the things that we must understand is that. Um, and I was talking in a conversation last night about this, is about coders. In other words, Mark Zuckerberg was saying most, you know, what I'd be telling kids to be doing now is go and study uh, programming, like code, how to write code, um, because the future is all about that. Um, but think about entrepreneurs, if, if mo it's going to be like a new language. Imagine if you're trying to do business and you don't know mathematics or English. How limiting would that be? So the reality is if we don't know how to create code, then we are, most of us are going to be in a situation where we don't know the language of the future. So we are either going to have to employ these people or to learn that skill set ourselves. So for the younger people, definitely if you can write code, you can, how many apps can you create? How many future software type things can you create? There's massive opportunity in that. So remember the world is changing. So are we going to keep up with that? We either have to have the skill set or we have to buy the skill set. Make sense? So in other words, you employ the skill set. So I got the idea straight after talking, going, you know, well, it's probably a good idea to employ a coder. You know, someone that knows code to be just working on creating stuff, like a research development arm of your company. I mean, rather than paying for apps, imagine if someone, you know, developing new applications, if only one of them becomes successful. So there's a whole range of opportunities now. Kids that are selling apps, you know, might only get a couple hundred thousand for them. Some, a couple of million for them in Silicon Valley, that's happening all the time. They, they create an app, they get two or three million for it and go and buy themselves a nice apartment. Well, or if you create a really good app like, say, Instagram, and you get a billion dollars for it. 12 staff hasn't made a profit in billion dollars. That's what's available now through this new technology, through what the world has changed to, and that didn't exist five years ago. <laughs> Who's excited by that, by the way? Yeah. Okay. So you either have to learn those skill sets or hire that skill, those skill sets. Is this making sense? Yeah. So you're going to apply this to every business. You ought to be thinking, how can, I give, how can I get a lot of potential clients so I can afford to be fussy and only work with the best ones? Okay. And how you're going to do that is you give stuff away for free. So how hard is it to be a good marketer? It's not. You just have to give stuff away for free. Does everyone get that? Yeah. Now, how many restaurants you say, well, he's like, okay, give a free coffee away. And you'll fill your restaurant. Oh, no, we couldn't do that because they're focused on the cost of giving something away. But they have never worked out a lifetime va value of a customer. Let's look at an, ex <coughs> an example. Uh, Stefan, who's heard of Stefan hairdressing? He's pretty big in Queensland. He built a whole business model on this, okay? So his marketing funnel was um, hair uh, dressing salons, okay? So he figured out that if he gave away, you know, especially when there wasn't enough people in the hairdressing salon, so he got his staff and gave him promo cards to go out in the shopping centers where they were and give away a free haircut, okay? Now, the target market was predominantly women. Why? Because women spend a lot more on ha haircuts. True, women? And women tend not to change their hairdresser as often. Men, we're going, we have no loyalty to a hairdresser. 
we'll go to the nearest hair, wherever we get our hair cut, true? And we'll pay hardly anything because we don't get charged anything. The world is a sexist world, is it true? Women get, have to pay three, four times the amount, okay? Uh, I'm not sure the sexism is coming from the men, though. It's usually female hairdressers that charge. I mean, that's the way the world is. But women will spend a lot more. So he knew his target market was women predominantly because they'll spend a lot more, okay? Not only in their hair, but everything else, facials, etc. So he could afford to give away a free haircut because he was able to measure. Now, obviously, he tested and measured on one store, okay, free haircut. Let's say if he's already paying the operation cost of a, of a store, the free haircut's not costing that much more, okay? But let's say it's costing him $3 additional cost. And he gives away 100 free haircuts. Now, to, give away a, to get 100 people to come in for a free haircut, he might have had to give away 500 vouchers. Make sense? And then 100 come in. So it costs him $300 hard additional cost to cut those as an example, I don't know the exact figures are. These days would be a lot more. But this is how he built his empire. So, but then what you've got to do, understand this, you need to know the life, jot this word down, lifetime value of a customer. Some of you would have heard that before, some of you don't. That could be the most important words in the history of your business career. The lifetime value of a customer, if you don't know what they are, how much it is worth to you, then how do you know what you're doing in business? Lifetime value of a customer. What does that mean? It means pretty much what it says. What is a customer worth to you over the lifetime? You need to try and measure this. Because if you can measure it, um, let's say, okay, let me ask, ladies, how often do you get your hair cut? How many times a year? Four, six, eight. This could create a whole issue here, couldn't it? Every six weeks. Okay, every six weeks? Trust me, I know women that go every week. They might get their hair cut, but they get stuff done with their hair. Blow wave every, every yeah, I know, yeah, every week. So eight times a year, eight, to get the hair cut, but as far as go and do all that other stuff. Yeah. Some would go, it depends, okay. There's some women that go every week, because I know, okay. Okay, so it could be anywhere from six to 12 times a year doing something, whether it's just a blow wave or what. I don't know if they have it in Australia, but in LA, they actually have places that don't cut hair, they just do your blow wave your hair. So that's, I walked in there as one to get a haircut, and they're like, no, we don't cut hair here. I'm like, what do you do? <laughs> and can I just clarify, we do that, not just for ourselves, but actually for men. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Okay. Yes, that's an interesting story. Most women don't buy a nice dress or dress up to impress men. They do it to impress other women. Yeah. True? Because women are very competitive, so it's more like what other women will think. Us men, we don't really have to spend a lot of time on dressing well because we just immaculately know how to do it. <laughs> okay, okay. Yes, yeah, true. No, it's good that that's the first woman I've ever heard that's dressed up to impress a man. I've never heard that ever before. So, really? Yes. Well, I dress to impress myself first, and then secondly a man, and I don't care about that. So oh, okay, yes, yeah, that's good. Okay, <laughs> thank you for sharing that. <laughs> Can we get this example right? Let's say blow dry your hair, something with your hair, cut your hair six to 12, let's say eight times a year. Okay. You do something, okay? Let's say 10 for easy figures. The point is, and how much do you spend on a haircut if you're a woman? Fifty-five? Hundred? Does anyone go to Turak? How much is it in Turak? 155. Okay, so it depends where you go. So a hundred bucks. Okay, let's, okay, hundred dollars, okay? You went 10 times a year. Is there women in this city that would spend $1,000 looking pretty a year? Yeah. Hell yeah. <laughs> I don't know. So this is, this is actually fairly understated, okay? So that's $1,000 a year, okay? Let's say he's, got, he's given away 100 haircuts 
It's cost him $300 extra cost in the salon because he's already paying cost of people to be there. Uh, and that's cost him, what, $300. And let's say how many of these might come back if they've got a free haircut there and they like the experience out of 100? 25% could come back. Sometimes maybe more. Depends on the experience, etc. Okay, let's say 25%. So 25 of them become regular clients and they spend a thousand bucks a year each as an example. So he's picked up $25,000 in extra revenue. And now how, how long do you stay with your hairdresser for? One year, two year? What's the lifetime expectancy of the client? Would it be three years average? I've been, I've been with mine for 12 years. 12 years? You're, more, you're a swinging voter, I know. <laughs> okay, so it's 12 years any longer than 12? Forever. Forever, yeah. So, I mean, this is a very good example because the lifetime value, imagine to get a new client, if you look after and giving great service, the lifetime value can go on. Let's say you're going you to work it out and on average it's three years. Your lifetime expectancy of the customer is three years. Knowing that you're always going to do this on a conservative level, it could be more if you really look after them. So three years. So you're picking up $75,000 worth of business by giving away $300 hard costs. Let me ask you this question. Is that a good return on investment? Yes or no? Yes. See, now when you can start to think creatively, okay, where a lot of business owners won't give away anything for free because they're worrying about the cost and not looking at the potential return. To be rich, you have to be generous. Uh, so that is the challenge. Now, daily deal sites, when they first started out, they really utilized this concept a lot. They said, why don't you give something away cheaply, like a restaurant meal, to get people into your restaurant or to get people into your uh, hair salon or whatever it was, with the idea that the, a lot of those people would come, or X percentage would come back. Now, some of those campaigns have worked very well for businesses. Others of them didn't because a lot of the people that were going for the deals were people that weren't loyal customers that were just after the deal. Okay, you know, groupies, they called them in, in the US, Groupons. They were just after the deal, so they weren't the, they weren't the targeted client was the challenge. But even then, if they only got a small percentage, they could still profit from that long term. Making sense? So you've got to look at how do you drive people to your business in the first place. You've got to have a good product or service to get people to stay. You're just assuming that. Um, but you can see some of these concepts can rapidly grow a business. Now, is that more effective than him running a yellow page ad? You know, like biggest waste of money on the planet, okay? All these old type, you know, or paying for directories listings and all that crap. So once he's got that to work on one, franchise or one of his stores, he can now scale out with confidence. He can now go, do it on all the stores. I can afford it because we know it's going to work. And they've got to make sure they can handle the business. The challenge with some of the daily deal um, campaigns for businesses, they got such an influx of business, they couldn't handle it. Okay? And because they weren't getting paid a lot of money up front, they were, like, they were treating the customers poorly. As a result, customers wouldn't come back. So it's got to be done properly. That's why you test it and measure it. Once it works, boom, away you can go. So you want to be thinking of all those potential ways that you can do that. Quickly turn the person next to you and teach them how to rapidly grow a business with little or no cost. Go for it. OK. Making sense so far? Yes. Who has thought of at least one idea to increase revenue? Raise your hand. Who's thought of many ideas, okay? You can test and throw these around, but really want you to tap into your creativity. When you're here this weekend, you know, I think they've got drinks on the end of each day. And we, these, these events will finish earlier than like our typical uh, other events, which will go late to 1 a.m. in the morning. Um, <laughs> where, so these will finish by at least midnight. And um, no, we have one final, I'll, I'll finish up soon, we have one final speaker. The speaker you have this afternoon is great uh, on social media, which fits in what we're talking about, how to grow your business with social media. And then I'll be back tomorrow as well. Uh, we have a whole host of speakers for you tomorrow. And then we finish up Monday uh, night. Uh, I'll be back on about 6 o'clock Monday to, to wrap it up. Um, so I'm going to take a few questions here because, you know, what I'm suggesting while you're here is really network and share ideas and ask people what they do 
uh, because you'll get ideas. This is a chance to cross-pollinate. In other words, people from different industries. The challenge in most industries, uh, if you ask them, why do you do what you do? And they'll go, well, that's because that's the way it's always been done. They just copy each other. When you could go to other industries and see what they're doing and bring those ideas back to your industry, many of them will apply. So don't just do the same thing, same old, because that's the way it's always been done. Tomorrow I'll talk about, you know, when we go into marketing a little bit more, there's so many different ways to grow a business. And this is giving you a big clue, the start of it. Um, but there's also, most businesses have hidden assets. So if you have a business, you're probably sitting on hidden assets that when I share some of them with you, you'll be able to turn them into cash instantly. Um, where you can make a lot more money with no extra effort. Most businesses are doing all the hard work and not getting the profit, and I'll explain to you why that is. Um, before we do that, does anyone have any questions? Let's take a few questions on, and we'll start right down the front, uh, on what we've covered so far. Far away. Is it on? Um, there seems to be quite a uh, struggle with the... Um, with the pay at thank you um, with the what sorry uh, with the pay as you feel market and um, what do you mean pay as you feel market as in, as in like a pay what you think uh, this uh, product is truly worth uh, there seems to be a bit of a struggle with that I'm just wondering how do you uh, think people um, and, entre and entrepreneurs, how, how uh, do you think they can make that work? Okay, so can you give me some examples? I'm not familiar with it. What do you mean by uh, pay as you feel or pay how much you think something's worth? Um, What's some you, examples? Of? Are you familiar with the restaurant lentil as anything? Yeah. Oh, okay, yep, yep, yep. yep. There's that. They've uh, been uh, through quite a struggle and also there's... Um, Is there there's some, I've seen some of those restaurants where they're, 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 it's a non-profit type restaurant. Uh, Pretty much, yep. uh, but they've been struggling to keep alive because it's been a bit of a difficult yeah, the thing. Cha the challenge with human psychology, what it'll attract is a lot of people in society uh, expect a free lunch um, and they have a sense of entitlement. And you give an example, and we're all being guilty of this at times. How many times have you watched free to air TV and bitched about the commercials? Who's ever bitched <laughs> about commercials? See, that's a sense of entitlement. It's not conducive to wealth creation. So you shouldn't bitch. You should go, you know what? I appreciate those ads because they're allowing me to watch TV shows that cost millions or tens of millions to produce, which I haven't had to pay a cent for, uh, for free. Does that make sense? That's the way we should look at it, but we don't look at that. Because we've got so many things, so many models, like TV was one of the first models to use free, give away free, and then charge the advertisers, our third party free model. Um, so we often take for granted uh, these things, and that's what happens. So in a lot of those, there's a lot of people don't, like I'm a generous person, so I have a rule, for instance, I can never walk past a charity bin without putting cash into it. Um, the challenge when I go to the airport, sometimes you have to walk past them several times, so uh, it gets quite expensive and they don't issue tax receipts. So, um, but yeah, if I went into those places, I have been, like there's one in Melbourne in St Kilda, I think, um, and yeah, I always pay extra. Okay, but that's because I have a healthy mindset around money and I realize the more you give, the more you get. Most people are poor, they're poor for a reason, because they'll only give a little bit. Does that make sense? But that's a reflection of where that might say, well, they don't have much money to give. No, it's if you, I, you always, whenever you give money, you're giving and you like to charity or something more than you use. Like I generally tip a lot. I'll always tip taxi drivers. For an extra 10, 15, 20 buck tip, you can make someone's day. I mean, that's, a, that's like, I get a lot of enjoyment out of that. Like, they're not a day, if they don't do a good job, I don't, but I like tipping people because it can just make the whole day, okay? Uh, if people are grateful for it and don't take it for granted. Does it make sense? So some of those models will struggle because of human psychology. Um, people are generally stingy, um, but that's why they're not rich. So it, it's a, be, a, be a hard model to make money. Online, if you're talking about pay as you go online, I don't know, I mean, most models, I'm not familiar with where you have a choice of how much you pay. It's generally free and then you eventually pay if you want to upgrade to something better. But, um, but wouldn't it be uh, a little dangerous to be blaming uh, the people for being stingy? 
Well, it depends if you're asking if you want to build a business model. So when I say giving things away for free to grow a business, is different to if you have a restaurant and your business model is non-for-profit and you're, you're giving it as a service. Does that make sense? That's a completely different scenario. And when you're giving it as a service, you're not expecting to make a profit because you charge if you were. Does that make sense? Uh, or you would, if you're not charging the people that come there and you generally don't mind those people coming there not paying a lot, you would then go third party and charge third party. In other words, you go and get sponsors and donors to fund it, okay? Um, but if it's not designed for people that generally can't afford things, well, that's, a, that's like a, a soup kitchen or something. That's a different story. That's a charity type thing. Make sense? But don't confuse this with what I'm talking about here. Give your product away for free. We're saying create a product or give something away to attract a large liege and build a community. I mean, think of Facebook. You know, what have they, how have they done that? They haven't charged you to use Facebook, despite the rumors. Year after year, Facebook's going to eventually wait till there's a billion people signed up and then charge you to use Facebook. You know, whether they ever will or not, I doubt it. Uh, they could. You know, imagine if you're in charge of Facebook and we need to generate some extra revenue. What if we just charge everyone a dollar a month? Yeah. There's an extra billion dollars a month to the bottom line. It would kind of be tempting, wouldn't it? And they'd make a lot of money, but they'd probably shrink it, etc. But what they could do, uh, Facebook um, could make a lot more money. They could say, well, if they wanted to, if you have a, you know, when you get to 5,000 friends, you can't have any more friends. So why can't you pay a fee per year? to increase that to 10,000. They could easily do that, people wouldn't mind. Uh, or what they may charge in the future is fan pages. If you have a fan page, usually businesses are doing those, thi those things, so they will be prepared to pay a yearly fee ongoing to have a fan page. But Facebook doesn't at this point because they're going, well, we'll keep that free, keep giving those free services, we get more and more people coming there and we're making money from advertising. So we want to grow that advertising model, but you'll see Facebook get much more aggressive at monetizing their hidden assets. So that'll be a great example to watch how they monetize what they do. And they're already charging where you can pay to have your posts show up higher, et cetera. So they're testing and, and they, test, they tested that in New Zealand as an example. New Zealand, any Kiwis in the room? New Zealand, uh, we always welcome our Kiwis. New Zealand is a, uh, is a test country. It gets a lot of products first because companies around the world test it on New Zealand. It's a small economy, but it's a Western economy. So it's a good a feel for a lot of markets, whether they'll work around the world. So New Zealand often gets a lot of things first, okay? Because um, they're a great test market. Does it make sense? Any other questions relating to this? We'll go down the back very quickly, far away. I was just wondering, how can companies give things away? So there's obviously a, a big benefit in giving things away for free to build the customer base, but how can they do that without devaluing their currently established brand and potentially isolating their full paying customers? So an example of that that we're speaking about is the restaurant Kobe Jones, who advertise a lot on Groupon and, and yeah. those websites, yet their brand it has been established as a more high paying restaurant. Um, so yeah, just get your views on that. Yeah, no, I understand where you're coming from. So what you do, when we're saying give a, what you might call it, is sometimes it's, um, you know, jot down this word as well, lost leader. So sometimes you're not always going to give something away for free. It might be what's a lost leader. As an example, Google uh, is now has tablets out. Is that true? What do they call? Who knows what Google's tablets are? Nexus. Nexus. So that's considered a lost leader. Apple sells their iPads, et cetera, at good profit margin, because Apple can do that. Um, Google is not interested in really making money from the, the Nexus and the tablets. That's not their outcome. They have a third party business model. In other words, they get more and more people using Android on their tablets, even if it costs them money to get them in the hands of people, because then more people will use search on Google and they'll make more money. They make their money from advertising. Does that make sense? So they can afford to subsidize getting massive amount of people onto their product. Like Amazon, I think they sold, they sold the Kindle, right? They lost money every time someone bought a Kindle. But they've used b literally billions of dollars to subsidize those losses because the more people using Kindle and all more people using their products, will, they'll make money through their other divisions, i.e. buying things on Amazon. Make sense? So you've got you've to weigh it up. Some products you'll give away for free or some of those businesses don't have to give away their core product what they can give away is they re create a report or a digital product, something of value that exposes the company. Give that away for free to attract the people at the top of the funnel, and then that exposes more people, then will buy their core products. Does it make sense? 
So that's what you would look at doing. So that's why you would test to measure. If I think in your example of the restaurant, I dare say if that restaurant was a, a more upmarket type restaurant, then a daily deal campaign is probably not the right target market for it because that's what you wouldn't want to do. Okay? Uh, you can go the other way. Uh, remember, these are just ideas, but uh, there's a restaurant in, um, in England. So it was advised, okay, if you want to really uh, generate cash flow and boost. I don't know, Laurel may, may have shared this st story. Um, she'll be speaking on Sunday, so we'll see. If she sa shares that story, that's where I heard it from. Um, but what they did is say, okay, how do you make um, more money? So why don't you charge and say for your restaurant, the only way that you can eat here, you have to pay in advance. So you're putting up the ABC, you're making, this is your condition of um, doing business with them. Because remember, a lot of restaurants, you want prestigious restaurants. So a lot of people only go to the restaurants no one else can get into. They say, okay, we'll take bookings, but you have to pay in advance and pay us up front to get that. Okay, not even just deposit, you have to pay the full amount, but what we'll do, we'll give you a certain price if you pay in advance, but it's the only way you can book, you have to pay in advance, well in advance to be able to um, attend the restaurant. Does that make sense? So they're able to generate a lot of pre-sales and when most restaurants don't get paid to the night of the restaurant, they generate a lot of cash flow up front. Okay, so there's by creating models and saying this is the condition of doing business with me. There's different markets. If you're a prestigious brand, well, you're probably not going to be giving away free Tiffany's, okay, or free Ch uh, Chanel bags. One, you don't need to because you already have a market and you're a prestigious brand, and you're already you already have a powerful brand, so you don't need more people into your stores. You'd be looking at other ways to generate extra revenue, okay. Um, but then there's other models. Look at uh, is it Costco, which is open in Melbourne, which is a US um, you know, grocery wholesaler, where they charge to use their shopping their supermarket, you have to pay a membership. Is that true? And they make a lot of their money from memberships. So they've gone the opposite, where normally it's something for free, they've gone and they're charging up front. Okay? You pay a membership, okay, and then you get discounted food. So they've used the discounted food as a lure to charge a membership and then they get hundreds of thousands of people. So it's just being creative and thinking outside the square. But yes, you've got to look at your target market. Who is your client? If you've got a premium brand, you're going to do things differently to if you don't. Or if you're smart, like a lot of companies, they'll have multiple brands. They'll have the premium market brand, and then they'll release under a different brand uh, a similar product for a different target market that might be sold cheaper. So you can sell your product to different segments. People that want quality will pay, want to pay more. They're not going to, if it's too cheap, they won't buy your product. That's why you have to test price. So, but if we look on this model, is when we're giving away things for free, you might be creating a product of value to give away for free. Generally, it's going to be an information product because we live in a digital age. So it's going to cost you absolutely zero in a digital product to give away for free. Does it make sense? That's why they can, you can afford to lower the cost base and give stuff away for free. If it's digital, it doesn't cost anything. That's the ideal product you'll give away for free. And most people are going to find your business in the future via Facebook or via Google and to a website, true? So you can easily give something away for free. Even if it's free education about what your business does. Uh, I have a friend, he's, he's been quite successful over the years building a lot of companies, a young guy. Uh, well, he's my age, so he's fairly young. And um, he's moved to, to the US and he started the business six months ago. He's doing 100,000 a month already. He's got six staff in the US and about 40 outsourced staff in, uh, in, through Odesk overseas. Um, but all they do is they, give a, they create an, a video animations. You know, the corporate videos companies used to have. Well, now that doesn't work anymore. It's all about people watching on YouTube or the internet. Uh, really cool, animated, corporate videos that sell and tell the message in a funny way about what the company does. Because people on YouTube, they'll watch this stuff. He charges $3,500 uh, per, per video to create for a company, outsources most of the work, and companies love it. And the business is just taking off in America because it's quite inexpensive for a company to create it. Because you've got to get impact. You've got to have some way of reaching people online. So if you've got something that's funny, uh, that's animated, that's exciting, rather than a boring, bland corporate video no one's going to watch, so they can create this and give it away and they get lots of hits and lots of viral traffic if it's really cool. And they generate a lot of exposure for their company. Making sense? Okay, so with technology these days, there's a massive trend moving where people, more people become publishers of their own books, of their own magazines, of their own DVDs, thanks to YouTube and Facebook. 
uh, Randy Zuckerberg said when she was out here, Mark Zuckerberg's sister a few months ago, and she said, basically everyone is a, a media company. You want to understand that. And here's why a lot of people aren't wealthy. I, I see so many people on Facebook, is some of the stuff they write on Facebook is just ridiculous. And I'm thinking, these same people would like to be wealthy, but they're not wealthy for a reason, because they put dumb stuff on Facebook. They don't understand they are a brand. Every one of us is a brand. We are a product or service and a commodity, whether we like it or not. And on Facebook, and Mark Zuckerberg, his goal was to say, and with Facebook, one of these goals was that people shouldn't have a separate professional life and a separate personal life. They should be congruent. They should be the one person. Now, whether you agree with that or not, that's Mark's, one of Mark's goals. You say, I want people to be authentic and they shouldn't have separate lives. Who they are professionally is also who they are as a person. True? Which is there's a lot of truth in that. And that's what was one of his goals with Facebook. So, but if people, how many people don't realize they might have a professional life, but they then they put dumb things on Facebook and they lose their job or uh, they lose clients or the classic case was the guy, the CEO of Energy Watch, was it? That lost his whole company because they put, he put racist comments on uh, YouTube or something. Okay, in a drunken state or whatever. I mean, that, that's the, whether we like it or not today, um, the level of social accountability has become very high. Okay, because if you do anything, you know, the world has Facebook and Twitter, um, you're a public profile whether you like it or not. And once you're on Facebook, you are to some degree a public profile amongst the people that follow you. Making sense? So you see so many people, they don't understand they are a brand. So they'll write stuff. I've seen it with some people. They write stuff that's just dumb. They, if they, everyone had a share price, their share price is going down like this every time they write stupid messages about stuff that's not adding value, about stuff that people don't really want to know about. Uh, or really, it's a private message they should send to that person privately, not in a public forum. Um, who's following what I'm saying here, the dumb stuff you see on that? Are they enhancing their brand? Are they building credibility and respectability? Are they building a community that would follow them? Absolutely not, because they don't realize they are a media company, but what they're putting out there about themselves is not building their brand. Making sense? So we have to think about that. Everyone now is a media company. Everyone also has to be responsible. The challenge with the internet, because it's free, is people can defame people and get away with it. And you saw it was a Melbourne man last week, did you see that, sued Google and won. He also sued Yahoo and won. So now, finally, these uh, search engines have to be responsible and can't say whatever's on the internet is not our fault. When people search through Google and find defamatory things that are false and misleading, damaging people's careers, then now Google is held responsible. I sued Google in the Supreme Court two years ago, or 18 months ago. It was the first landmark case of a victory against Google worldwide. Um, over, a, over a hate site because Google knew who run that and they got sued and Google lost. Um, so eventually there'll be more and more people now after this case in Melbourne case where they lost that will start suing Google. Or Google, what they'll have to do is when they're threatened to sue, they'll have to remove the links, which should, should be the way. The internet needs cleaning up. There's no regulation. Uh, I'm not usually a, a, a pusher of regulation because we're usually over-regulated, but you've got to have that balance. Is that true? Um, because you can't say those things in the newspaper and get away with it, but on internet people can. So um, that's, that's what's going on in those cases. The other thing I want to cover before, we're going to have a five minute break and have our final speaker on for today. I'm going to be back tomorrow and um, <coughs> go through some more things with you. So you can digest this and then we'll go in. How do you really quadruple your income? But here's one idea for you is... What you want to be doing is that let's sell, say you have a product and you sell a product and let's say 5% of the people that come to your website or whatever um, end up becoming a client and your product is, you know, uh, whatever it is, let's say it's a $1,000 product and 5% buy. So every 100 people come here, you generate 5,000 in sales. Okay, makes sense? And the internet's great because you often can automate a lot of those sales. A lot of client companies do all that work to generate that. And then they forget about looking after their customer and they go back to focusing on getting another 100 prospects. Making sense? Advertising, spending more money. And that's th their entire business. When it's not very smart, what they should do is go, what else? There's a saying, it's seven times, jot this down, it's seven times easier to resell an existing client than it is to find a new one. It's also far more profitable 
because you don't have to spend on advertising dollars anymore. A relationship has been built. There's trust there. Seven times easier to resell an existing client than it is to gain a new one. And this is where most businesses fail. They neglect their existing customers because they're too busy chasing new ones. <coughs> True? True? That's one of the biggest causes of failure. When what they should be doing is going, what does my community, what do my clients want? What else do they want? What else can I give them? How else can I enhance their life to help them to go where they want to go in whatever aspect your product or service is? That's what they should be thinking of. Then go, how do we then develop a what, jot this word down, back-end product. How do we develop a back and product number two, which we call a back-end product? In other words, this is the front-end, the first product clients come into the store for or into your internet website for. Your back-end product is what is the next products they may uh, then or services invest in. Often, a back-end product is where you can make more money and you could effectively double or triple your sales by not chasing new customers, but by simply creating another product for your existing customers. Who's following what I'm saying here? Repeat after me. Hmm, something to think about. You definitely should be thinking about this in business. Now, something like, oh, I'm already doing that. Well, then how do you create another back-end product where you might have product three? Does it make sense? Because you're now extending the lifetime value of your customer as well. Jot this down. This is what I learned from Jay Abrahams. And this is so critical. You might put it in. It's in your notes as well as a graph. There's only three ways to grow a business. Okay? One is that I've covered before early in the coffee shop story. Charge more. Three ways to grow a business. Charge more to existing clients. Number two is increase the number of clients that you have, obviously, in your business. Everyone wants more customers. And number three is to increase the frequency of clients. Now, I don't know whether you have a PowerPoint on it, but it's in your notes. Um, we might pull it up tomorrow. The J. Abraham's Three Ways to Grow a Business. It should be on PowerPoint or it's in the PDF. We'll pull up on the screens tomorrow and I'll go through it. And you'll just see, I talked about the example before by increasing the uh, charging 10% more led to a 300% increase in bottom line profits. Well, when you do a percentage increase on the number of clients you have and the amount of times they spend with you, you can get thousands of percentage increase by just tweaking your business slightly. So by doing here, one, we charge more. So you might, what we talked about before, but then you increase the amount of times your clients spend with you which is a lot more revenue in this and a lot more profitable because you're not chasing new customers. It's you know, already a relationship is built. Uh, then you go about, then if you add to the funnel and put more clients through the whole thing, that's when you have a business really accelerating on all levels. And we're just tweaking these things a little bit. Now, some people might say, well, I don't have any other products. Well, you don't have to create the other products for your clients. You can say, who else has products that my clients might want? And then you can go on JV. What's JV stand for? Joint venture, go to your competitors, go to other companies and say, look, my customers might like your product. Can I have you sell those products to my customers and will you pay me a commission? Or can I white label your product and wholesale it to you? I will sell it and I'll pay you a wholesale amount. Of course, other businesses usually say yes because they want more business. All of a sudden, you can now bring in other products product four, five, and six, and then market them back to your clients. If it's something you know your clients will want, all of a sudden, your revenue is going through the roof. This is how you grow companies rapidly. Making sense? Thinking, working smarter, not harder. Where most companies are spending all this time chasing and building new clients, new database, the most expensive type of thing. That's the biggest mistake they make. They don't develop a lifetime relationship with their clients. They don't add more value and continue to do that. Making sense? That's the, one of the biggest mistakes they make. The other mistake they make, and this is why most websites fail, and we can talk about this tomorrow as well, and a lot of the other speakers will, is very simple. They are trying to um, sell 
as opposed to educate, but they're trying to go for the sale too soon. In other words, business, you're trying to build your community or build your relationship. So why do you go for the sale? Guys, if you're dating a girl that you're serious about, do you go for the sale too quickly, yes or no? Yes or no? Okay. You build a relationship over time of trust, etc. So you have to be, don't go for the sale so quick. So how many websites don't even have an opt-in? Like if you have a website and you don't have a free, giving away something free as an opt-in, your website is completely useless. The whole point of a website is not to generate sales. Do you realize that? The whole point of a website is to get people joined onto your database so you can communicate with them and speak with your community and grow your community and to add value to them by giving them things educating them, helping them. That's what your website should be. Only after that should your website then engage and offer a product to sell. Making sense? Well, what are most websites, amateur websites? They put their price product on there, no opt-in, expect people to come on the first date and to buy. It just doesn't work that way, does it? Or maybe it does these days, but in business it's not meant to work that way. You have to build the relationship. Who's following what I'm saying here? You have to add value. You have to enhance their lives. That's your focus. And if you do that, you'll have a sustainable automated type business where people are raving fans and want to be and do business with you. Look at Apple. Apple went into retail. They were told, how can Apple do retail? They've never done retail before. Retail's going backwards. Retail's dying. Why would you start opening up retail stores in this e economic environment? And look how successful Apple has been because they deliver superior customer service. They focus on the customer. Do you see a cash register in Apple? If you want to buy something, you have to beg them to sell you something. Is that true? It's like, can I find somebody? Please take my money. They're not there. Like you go into a lot of stores. How many times you get sicker? Can I help you? They're just trying to sell you something. It's like, no, I can look, I'm looking for myself. Like, you don't want to be harassed. Where they're not trying to sell you anything either. They have created such great products and great brand following that you people queue up to buy their products. I was in the New York store a couple of weeks ago. I mean, you couldn't move. It's like I was lucky to be able to buy stuff there. You have to grab what, you know, can you please just process this? Here's my money. That's the sort of business you want to have. They do $35 million a, uh, per store on average, where most uh, uh, other retailers similar to them are lucky to do two or three. That's a great brand and a great product, and they know how to really market, and they're very focused. The reason Apple becomes so successful when Steve Jobs took, went back to the company late 90s, 1997, is that Apple had about 50 products. They were going bankrupt. Michael Dell of Dell Computers, which was a massive billion dollar computing company at the time, said publicly, I don't even know why Steve Jobs is trying. Why doesn't he just put Apple into bankruptcy and give the money back to shareholders? And um, Betty, wish he didn't say that. <laughs> Steve Jobs turned Apple around. The first thing he did was cut nearly all their products, even good products that were profitable. Cut, cut, cut. You need to focus. Cut it to about four products. And they focused on what they were really good at. And then they started creating some of the, obviously, the iPod. Uh, and then the I, uh, they had the iPad created well before the iPhone was released. They decided to hold it back. And they released the iPhone. And you've seen the success in the iPad. You know, so massive success of how he turned that company around. Uh, Apple become the most valuable company on the planet. At one point, they were over $700 a share. They were almost $650 billion market capitalization. And Dell, by the way, Dell Computers is now worth only $22 billion. So um, it's gone backwards and going backwards in, in, in a hurry. Okay? So you see how much can turn around in a period of time like that. So does that give you some food for thought? You want to be, your homework tonight is going, okay, uh, if you have a business already, one, how can I generate a lot more potential customers so I can be fussy about who I deal with and only deal with the best, the ones, and I set the conditions of how they can do business with me. So you're in charge. Uh, two, we talked about the coffee shop example. You can potentially charge more or segment your products. Some people want a platinum experience, so charge a lot more. You may rebrand the products differently to charge more and have two separate brands. So you have a brand for cheaper products and you have a brand for more expensive, so you segment your market. 
Um, so then also you looked at the, one of the most key critical distinctions is when your clients come into the funnel is to create back-end products or join venture with other companies so you have additional products to offer your existing clients. And often there's more revenue and profit here than there is here. So much so, then you can go to the next level, which is what we talked about, Amazon and Google. They will create this first product. They will sell at a loss, a loss leader, because they know they have these profitable divisions here. Does that make sense? They have these, so they can afford to even lose money here. That's when you're getting really clever. Or you go the business models that their product is free because third party uh, they make money, or in the case of Google, their product search is free because they're going to make money third party off advertisers that can advertise on Google. Makes sense? Facebook, same thing. A lot of the freemium model is advertising model. Okay? TV model. In other words, free TV, but you, you have to watch the ads. Making sense? Okay, so you've earned yourself a five minute break. We have then one final speaker on social media. You don't want to miss. Uh, this amazing woman, and she'll be speaking for just over an hour, and then you'll have an early night. How's that sound? So no midnight tonight. Give yourselves a huge hand.